ahead and get started. Any questions before we get rolling today? Hello, Professor. Good morning or afternoon now. Howdy, howdy. Yeah. Did you have a chance to look at ours exams? Uh, I have just started grading them. As it turned out, my uh, my 430 class had their exam on Monday and yours was on Tuesday. So I have been furiously working on both sets, but uh, I, I barely had a chance to scratch on yours. I, fin I finished their lab exams and I've just started your lab exams because in this format, the lab exams tend to be more challenging. So I've, I've just, just started looking at them. I've hardly had a chance to, uh, but uh, I, I will get them graded this weekend and you should have them back on Tuesday. And uh, so we can talk about those uh, more on Tuesday as well. Uh, I haven't, uh, uh, we'll talk about it when we get to the exams. There are some issues with the 430 classes uh, that I'm sure hopefully won't come up in you guys, but I'll, I will check that as we go through them. All right, any other questions? Uh, yes, um, I think you're missing the first day of the first week of next week, right? I'm sorry? On, uh, Thursday of 9.24. Yes, I, well, so uh, you are correct in that it isn't on the schedule here, not because we don't have class on the 24th. You just don't have anything due on that day. Oh, okay. So, yes, yeah, so no, we, we are still meeting on the 24th. We will still have lecture. You just don't have an assignment due. So, really, what I've got here, uh, what I try to do here with, the, with it is not to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about. That's what the syllabus is. This is more a reminder of what assignments are coming up so everybody remembers what their assignments are. But you are correct. It looks like, yes, there's the, uh, there's no assignment due on the 24th and so that's why it's there so yes Thank I it's not that i it's not that i forgot about it and it's not like it's a holiday or anything it's just we don't have anything due and that's why i didn't put it there i have one more, right. one more yes. small question uh, i remember from the lecture exam on the multiple choice questions there were there were some fetus questions that we didn't cover in the class uh, I, I, I would have to look at it to see what it is. I don't remember. I don't remember the specific questions from the test bank. Uh, the, the only, the only developmental things that I could think of is for instance, uh, you know, like the ligamentum, uh, arteriosum and the, uh, foramen, uh, ovale were definitely uh, structures you were responsible for on okay. the lab exam. And so obviously you needed to know what those structures were from. And so there, there were developmental aspects to those. Those are the only things that I could think of that would have necessarily been fetal related that way. Okay. But I, I'd have to look at the question to see. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, no, absolutely. I, I, I made a very strong point. You're always responsible for knowing the formulas. Because remember when we talk about, like for instance, we talk about respiration, uh, which we'll get to, uh, you know, shortly. Uh, and we talk about what a normal tidal resting breath is. Not everybody takes in the exact same volume. So as I, I, I think I was fairly clear about emphasizing that you absolutely positively are responsible for the formulas and knowing how these things relate. Uh, so that if I gave you random numbers, you'd be able to calculate it. And I think specifically the, the capillary exchange is one of those places where I said, you know, these are numbers that you need to know, but more importantly, you need to know those formulas because absolutely that is testable material. It's always going to be testable material. Those things matter. Uh, where did you get the model pictures from the lab exam? Uh, some of them are pictures from the models in the classroom. Some of them are things that I just found on Google. Some of them are from your textbook lab manual. I don't just take one place from them. Yeah, the, the CRC virtual lab, anatomy lab uh, uses pictures from the classroom. I know at AR we have more resources than they do. And uh, I know we're in the process of putting together our own uh, test bank, not test bank, but uh, lab bank that way. Jeff Chingaris is working on that uh, with uh, with uh, Sherry, our two people there. Um, and, and I appreciate that. Again, one of the challenges with this class is that, you know, anatomy and physiology is a three-dimensional field. We need to hold these things in our hands and be able to manipulate it. I mean, if you guys remember back to what 430 was like, you know, many of you had the opportunity to hold the bones in your hand and learn the bones by studying them in your hands. Uh, and, uh, but the, you know, my 430 class now, the 430 class over the summer had to learn the bones without holding them in your hands. Yes, that is unfortunately one of the disadvantages of this format. One of the things that I've said is I don't like that the process gets in the way of the learning and here online, that is definitely the case, but unfortunately this is a necessary evil that we have to deal with. And I don't know if it's been made official out in the real world, but, uh, we just got notification yesterday that spring is going to be 100% online. So, uh, for the time being, this is the format we are going to be using. 
Uh, so unfortunately, there are inherent problems with that. Uh, I typically curve the tests with Proctorio. I can't curve it the way that I curve it in the classroom, uh, but there typically is a curve to that. I, sorry if you were thrown off by the images, but what I will tell as I've said many times in this class, is that um, your job isn't to memorize the pictures in the textbook. Your job isn't to memorize the pictures in your atlas. Your job in this class is to learn this material. So as long as I provide you with what I believe to be an obvious example of something, then you should be able to identify what it is. So uh, again, I, I'm not going to apologize for that. You're not going to, the good job of this class isn't to memorize the pictures in the textbook, it's to learn this material. Yes, again, if you remember from your, uh, from your syllabus quiz, you have that uh, box on the side where your video image is that has the magnification on that. So you can remember you had to make it bigger so that you could see that it said cab. If you're having difficulty seeing one of the images, use that, use that magnification tool. That's why I forced you to do that on the syllabus so that you would know it's there as a tool that you could use on the real exams. But so that's what you need to do to make those bigger. I, I cannot affect the format of the exam in that way. I can't make those things uh, work that way. So again, I, I, I make them as big as I possibly can. Those images are massive uh, volume wise and size wise, uh, which is one of the reasons why sometimes it takes people a long time to load it. Um, but, uh, but like I said, uh, again, as long as, it's a, as you have that tool and that's why I, I tried to challenge you guys to use that during the practice one so that you knew it was there. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, do you have another one? Uh, yeah, I, a pen and pencil would be something to be useful uh, for the models. What I would encourage you to do is to go to the open labs. Jeff has uh, lots of these models that he can walk you through to help you with those materials. It is going to be as helpful in this portion of the class because for this section, there isn't as much model models. There's a lot more histology on this section of the class. Um, uh, but uh, like when we get to the digestive system, things along those lines, uh, yes, although my understanding is he does record those things. So maybe if you're not able to make that, if you send him an email or something like that, he may be able to walk through it. I think he records them. I don't know that for certain. Uh, yeah, I, obviously I'm a very tactile learner, so I like pen and pencil as well. But again, this is online. This is the format that we have. Okay, well, next time ask him. I can't control that. Yes, the format that you took this lab and lecture exam is going to be the exact same format for all the exams for this test. And that's the other important thing to remember. Whether you were super successful on this lab and lecture exam or you really struggled on this lab and lecture exam, uh, this class has a lot of points, this class has a lot of exams, and regardless of how anybody did on this test, every single person in this class is still capable of getting an A in this class. You just have to figure out whether the way you've been studying this material is currently successful for you or not. If it is not, then you have to change the way that you're attacking this material so that you are going to be successful. And if you were successful, then you can't rest on your laurels for the rest of the time either. You just have to continue to do what you're doing. But like I said, my goal is to not let the process get in the way. The exact same way I wrote this lab and lecture exam is exactly how I'm going to write the rest of the lab and lecture exams. So you know now exactly what to expect. All right. And like I said, I know Jeff has models, so all you have to do is ask and he will show them. I have a question. Yes. You don't by chance have some of those models that you could like show us. I know we're supposed to ask Jeff. I do not have, no, I, okay. I do not have access to any of these models. I do not, the instructors don't have any access to those. It wouldn't be fair for me to have some model that some other instructor wouldn't, which is why it was decided that Jeff, as the instructor assistant, uh, would be able to take some of the models out of the lab so that he would have them in a central place that everybody would be able to have access to. Uh, there are times where there are pictures of things that I've shared, and, and as we have that, I, I try to share those things as we go through them uh, for things that way. Uh, and like I said, we have lots of other resources, the CRC one, there are other websites. And like I said, a lot of times when I need something, I just go to the Almighty Google to get it myself. So uh, you do have materials like your textbook, your lab manual, your photographic atlas. Uh, as I mentioned, if you, you, when you go to the, to the, uh, the, the um, 
what is it, your professional anatomy lab, the professional anatomy lab, the PAL thing in your mastery in A&P. There are models on there where you can look at. So some of the models uh, that I used were those models from that resource as well. So uh, make sure you're using all the resources that you have to help you to be successful, especially if you're paying for these resources, you should be taking advantage of. Actually, that, that was it helped me because I looked before at the mastering and AP uh, picture models, and it helped me on this. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Because again, that 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 it has the cadaver pictures, which are really cool. Uh, but at the same time, it also has pictures of the models, so it is very very helpful that way. Yeah, absolutely. Good. This isn't the way that I want to teach this class. I'd never asked for this to be online. I know you never asked for this to be online, but unfortunately, this is the format we are stuck with. And so this is the best that we're gonna be able to do with. All right. But like I said, you've had a lab and lecture exam now. There are no more surprises. You know exactly what is gonna be expected on you of these things. The same way I wrote these is gonna be the same way that the other ones are gonna be written. Exact same format, exact same style. So uh, you know exactly what to expect. And like I said, I don't care how you did on this exam. Uh, there's enough points in this class. Remember your lowest lecture score can be replaced by the final. Every single person in this class is still capable of getting an A if that is their goal. All right, if you just weren't successful on these first tests, then that means that you need to change the way you're attacking this material to help you to be successful. All right. Any other questions? And since we're talking so much about the exam, I will bring up the last two X issues that came up in 430. I haven't, like I said, I barely started looking at your guys' exam, so I haven't run into this problem yet in the last one, but they're both things that I thought were obvious, but apparently need to be stated anyway. Uh, the first is no headphones of any type during the exam. You can't wear your AirPods, you can't wear your headsets, even if they're noise canceling so your kids don't bother you. There's no way for me to know and control what's going into your headsets and you cannot wear headsets. The other thing that I thought should be obvious and apparently after grading some of my 430 exams isn't, the very first question on your exam is that integrity question where you were stating to me and the university that you are doing this all on your own. If you don't answer that question, that is the same as saying false. That is basically saying that you cannot trust this test. And if you do not mark a true for that first statement, then you will automatically get a zero on the exam. All right, you need to verify that you are doing this on your own. And if you do not verify that you are doing this on your own, then you will get a zero on the exam, even if there's no obvious examples of cheating. All right, obviously for those people, if you, if you made that mistake on this one, uh, and again, there's nothing obvious on the recording, then you will not get a zero. But from this point moving forward, you must answer that question. And if you do not answer that question, you will get a zero. All right. Um, and again, we'll talk, about, we'll talk about more of these things when the tests come back next week. Yes. Go ahead. Um, it, uh, about in the test, I was like multiple times, I was asking to scanning the area around me again, like four or yes. five times in while I'm testing. Well, my guess is that it probably wasn't four or five, but you're right. Uh, the intelligence scan, you do. everybody has to scan the very first time you do it. And then after that, it's random somewhere between, I think it's like 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes, somewhere in that range. So if you're taking the lab exam, I mean, the lecture exam, for instance, which is two and a half hours, then yes, it may be possible that you have to scan as many as three yeah, times, depending on how it goes. Yes, yeah, I know too. But like it only happened at the last talk, uh 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes, like it happened for two times at that time. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know why that happened either. Again, I haven't looked at those. And like most, I think, and again, your lab exam was a little longer. Okay. So I don't you. know if you guys had to do it twice during the lab exam, but usually the lab exams are short enough that you typically only have to do it the once. Uh, but you guys did have a little bit of a longer lab exam. Uh, again, it's just unfortunately the nature of the proctorial protocol, right? It's a way of ensuring that, yes, you scan the room the first time, but then there's, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, your roommate hasn't brought you a big stack of note cards and put them on the table next to you while you're on camera. So it's just one of those things that unfortunately has to be done. I appreciate some people had problems with the proctorio. Proctor I do not have the ability to allow students back into the exam. The proctorio help can reset the exam, can get you guys back into it, uh, can do all of those things if you get locked out of it. 
uh, that can help you that way. Uh, so yeah, I, I, again, unfortunately, with this test proctoring process, I don't have a lot of control. The only thing I control is the availability of the exam. The good news is it doesn't happen often, but it does appear that every once in a while, someone on the test that has a problem with. So again, that's one of the reasons why we tried to set up this practice test ahead of time uh, to make sure that some of these problems are more resolved because some of them have to do with the speed of your computer or the RAM that's accessible or things along video cards, all of these types of things. Uh, maybe we need to have a second practice test that is more vigorous with the amount of material in it to hopefully uh, try to weed out some of these issues. All right. Anything else? Yeah, the, like I said, the lab exam, because it has those uh, large images in it, uh, that is one of the reasons why it takes a little, it's a little more challenging to load all that stuff and get it all at once. Uh, last spring, we tried the format of doing it one question at a time, similar to like we did in the, um, um, Oh, there you go. Yes. Thank you, Ashley, for reminding me about that. Thank you. Yes. That was one of the ways that Ashley, who had problems, was able to resolve it. Um, last spring, we did, in because of the uh, loading times that it may take for some of these large images, we tried to set it up so that you only loaded one image at a time, so it was less taxing on the computers that way. Uh, but uh, students aren't able to go back in that format and double check their answers, and, and it really didn't cut down on the technical issues, so most students liked the having it all on the screen at once format. But yes, with some computers, there are unfortunately some problems with that. Unfortunately, like I said, we are, we are um, relying on the technology in this case. And like I said, it's, it's not a satisfactory uh, format, but it's what we are forced to be able to do in this situation. All right. Anybody else need to vent? But to have this opportunity to have the exam at once is very um, like um, it's very good because you can return any time to to recheck what you, what you did because sometimes when you're hurrying you can make some mistake mistakes but you can return back so it's much more convenient if you no, I, like I said I, I it was um, like I said spring was a very big learning process when we were forced on here. And, uh, and again, it's all been a blur since then, especially with summer school. So I don't remember who was there or who wasn't there. Uh, but I will tell you that the students overwhelmingly preferred the format of having all the questions on the screen as once, as opposed to one at a time. So yeah, I mean, it wasn't even close. It wasn't like, you know, 55, 45. No, it was like 90% and like one person like the one at a time format or something crazy like that. So yeah, so this is, while it's not my preferred format, it seems that it, it slightly decreases the technical issues and students prefer it. So, uh, so that is the format that I'm using. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it was like I said, it was very overwhelming in the decision of, uh, of what it was. And like I said, I'm, uh, I, I don't like any of the formats of doing it this way. So if this is the one that students prefer, I am fine with that. All right, let's move forward. Talk about this next part, because uh, while the there were some challenges, obviously, and some frustration with this uh, previous exam, I will tell you historically that this next section typically tends to have a lower average uh, than the last one. Not necessarily because it's more challenging, but I would say that it is a less intuitive. Uh, this part, when we're talking about the lymphatic system, when we're talking about the immune response, when we're talking about the endocrine system, it is not like hearts and blood vessels and things that you can hold in your hand. It is about tissues and it is about cells and it is about chemicals and the chemical signals and the chemical interactions and all of those things. It is much less intuitive information and much more challenging that way. Um, hold on. Um, so 
because of that, you've really got to work hard in this section because this section, again, a lot of times when there are tricks and cheats and obvious ways to remember things, I try to give you that as much as possible. But often with the histology, when you're looking at tissues, even when they're tissues that are very different from each other, and that's going to be one of the nice things about the endocrine system. In the endocrine system, the tissues are very different from each other. But at the same time, it's still going to take some brute force memorization to make sure that you get this material. So it is going to be a challenge. The other thing that I think the, the concern that happens sometimes is the group presentation. I have in the past had students who become too focused on the group presentation that they're not worrying about the other material in the class. And I remember, remind you that this class is a numbers game. Yes, a 50 point group presentation is scary and you do want to spend time working on it. Uh, at the same time, your lecture exam is worth 100 points. Your lab exam in this section is going to probably be somewhere between, uh, I would say, 60 and 70 points. So while your group presentation is important, your lab and lecture exams are more important. So don't become so focused on your group presentation uh, that you forget to study all the other material that you are responsible for as well. Notice there aren't as many assignments in this section because instead I expect you to be working on your group presentations. There is only one unit review. Uh, there is only one uh, physio X and for that one you're only doing one activity, activity three, which is on the ELISA test. Uh, and there's one labster, an intro to immuno uh, immunology, which I think is a really useful tool. And then I want you guys to work on that. So, uh, so there aren't a lot of assignments for this because again, I'm expecting you to be working on your group presentations. Today after lecture, I will divide you up into your groups. Uh, once you're into groups, we will talk about, actually we'll talk about it before I put you in your groups. We will talk about what your responsibility is, what you're gonna be doing on this project is going to be how you're gonna do it and how you're gonna be successful. Then I will put you into groups, you will pick your topics, and then you'll have some opportunity the rest of the lab time to work together in those groups. I'll set you up in breakout rooms where you can work together and come up with a game plan of how you're going to attack this material. I will also be setting up a discussion board for you. Uh, yeah, the lecture slides for this unit are up, all uploaded on Canvas. They should be in the second unit. Is the second unit not available? Can you guys not see the second module? Section two, lymphatic system, immune response, endocrine system. All right, yeah, so it's there. Ah, good, okay, excellent. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so you'll have a discussion group where you guys can communicate asynchronously. Uh, if you wanna set up meeting times or share files or things along those lines, you can do that in your discussion groups. Uh, I will provide you with some class time today. Uh, we will probably have some class time on Tuesday, uh, depending on how the lecture goes, uh, to be able to, again, this is another one of those sections where I haven't taught it online yet, so I'm not sure how that's gonna go. Uh, we'll see how that works out. But there, if there is time, you should have time on Tuesday. Hope My goal is for you to have time on Tuesday to work it as well. But the time you have today and the time you have Tuesday is not gonna be enough. Now again, you are not required to meet outside of class time, but that's what the discussion group is for. If me and Oksana and Ashley are a group and we decide, all right, I'm gonna do these two sections and Oksana's gonna do those two and Ashley's gonna do the next two, uh, we can work on those independently and then post them to our discussion board and one of us can put them together or we can look at each other's work and work on things that way. So you're not required to uh, do it outside of class, but you are welcome to set up your own Zoom meetings to be able to get together and do that or FaceTime or whatever else makes you happy. Uh, you can go ahead and you know set up your, your Discord board where you're gonna wanna do that work or however you want to meet up and do it. So you can do it synchronously or asynchronously. Uh, both are acceptable and we'll talk about what the requirements are for that because the class time you'll have won't be enough. All right, those group presentations are going to be due on the 6th. That is when you will all be presenting those to the class. 
Uh, however, as you notice, the Monday night before I want your outlines, what I'm going to do is I will be posting those outlines onto our modules on Canvas so that people have the, the ability to access those and even print them out if they want to or download them and save them. So make sure you have everybody in your group's name on those outlines, uh, and your disorder obviously on that outline, and we'll talk more about the requirements for that outline, but that's actually going to be due Monday night before the presentations by 6 p.m. so I can make them available for people to access them because you are going to be responsible for this material both on the lab and the lecture exam, which is going to be on oh, Thursday the 8th. It's going to be the 8th, isn't it? Do I have that wrong? Uh, October the 8th, I'm sorry. So hold on. Um, so is it already in format and we just fill it out? Oh, you're talking about the outlines? No, you will make the outline, uh, you do the outline, you save it as a PDF, and you are going to submit that. However, there is no, there is no set format for the outline. And again, like I said, we'll talk about that when we get to the group presentations later. But you as a group will make an outline and submit that as a PDF so that everybody has access to them. One outline for the group? Yes, one outline for the group, that is correct. So you'll work on that together or use it however you wanna do it. All right. Any other questions on the game plan? All right, let's dive into lecture then. Like I said, the first thing we're gonna start talking about is the lymphatic system. I love your textbook for many, many reasons, but one of my favorite things about your textbook, I think they've actually removed it in the more recent copies, but in one of the original copies of this, uh, of your textbook when they talked about the lymphatic system, uh, they started out with the introduction that they can't all be rock stars. Right, and that's kind of the uh, lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is the redheaded stepchild of the organ systems of the body. But that doesn't mean that it isn't important, and so we will talk some about that. Like all organ systems, it is made up of different organs and other structures. One of the primary structures are the lymphatic vessels. Like the cardiovascular system, The lymphatic system contains vessels because it is specialized for transportation. However, there are some key differences. Right? How does the cardiovascular system move fluids in relation to the heart? True, it is going to it is going to mix with the interstitial fluid. That's true, but no, in relation to the heart. Well, you're right. Pressure changes is what causes it to move. You are correct. But directionally, directionally, how does blood move in relation to the heart? From the heart into the heart. Yeah, arteries carry it away from the heart, and veins carry it towards the heart. So it goes in both directions. It's a two-way transportation away from the heart and to the heart. Whereas lymphatic is only towards the heart. Right? There's only one way uh, travel in the lymphatic system, right? Absolutely, it has to do with the interstitial fluid, right, related to moving excess interstitial fluid. As you guys also mentioned, it is major pressure changes uh, that uh, cause the movement. What's the pressure typically like in the arteries, high or low? Hi. What's the pressure like typically in the veins? Low. No, absolutely. Like the veins, lymphatic vessels deal with low pressure fluid. Notice I keep saying fluid because is it blood that is in the lymphatic vessels? No. No. What is it? Good. What do we call the fluid? Lymph. Water. Yes, exactly. We call it lymph, right, versus blood. Both are primarily water, but have different components and things like that in it. We have that low pressure fluid. Because there is low pressure, there are typically valves, uh, one-way valves. Uh, valves in the lymphatic vessels. 
to help to assist in the movement. And there are also lots of anastomoses. You notice lymphatic vessels in many ways sound a lot like veins. They carry blood back to the heart. They have valves. They're dealing with low pressure fluid, right? And there are some similarities in the anatomy between these lymphatic vessels and our um, cardiovascular vessels, specifically the uh, veins. Uh, but there are some differences in them as well that we will talk about, right? And then obviously the volume moved, uh, there is a major difference as well. How much blood gets transported through your cardiovascular system during the course of the day again? Five liters. Well, you have five liters, but how many times is that five liters moved throughout your body during the course of the day? Isn't it 200 liters? Well, remember, 200 liters was the amount of filtrate, the amount of water we filter out in the in the blood. If I remember correctly, it was something like 6,000. Wasn't it something like 6,000 liters, 5,000 liters of blood that is pumped out of your heart during the course of a day? Something crazy like that? Yeah, absolutely. It was a massive amount, right? Your cardiovascular, pardon me, your lymphatic system only moves about two liters of fluid uh, in a 24-hour period of time, two to three liters of fluid. But guess how much leaks out of your capillaries in a 24-hour period of time? Same amount. Two, yeah, three about two to three liters. So again, it may not move a large volume, but it moves enough. It moves what we need to be moved. All right. Obviously, our lymphatic vessels are not the only structures in our lymphatic system. There are other organs, there are other tissues, and there are other cells involved. Uh, obviously, one of the primary things when you think of the lymphatic system, people think of their lymph nodes. But there are other organs like the thymus or the spleen, red bone marrow is an important component of our lymphatic system. And then we also have collections of lymphatic tissues. If you remember when we were learning about tissues back in 430, one of the things that we said is, if you look around the body enough, you will occasionally see an adipocyte just randomly in just some of the weirdest places. Those adipocytes are all over the place in all sorts of weird locations that you would find them in the body. Well, lymphatic tissues tend to be the same way. We find lymphatic follicles pretty much all over the place as we look through the tissues in the body. But there are some locations where those lymphatic tissues are accumulated into a, a structure that serves some function. And those are things like our tonsils or things like our Peyer's patches, uh, all of which are collectively known as our malts. Anybody know what MALT stands for? It's okay if you haven't, we haven't talked about it yet. Mucosa associated lymphoid tissues. Lymphoid tissues should be obvious. Mucosa, remind me again what a mucosa is? It's a lubrication. Mm -hmm. Produces mucus. Absolutely. Mucosas do indeed produce uh, mucus, providing for lubrication or for uh, protection, things along those lines. But more specifically, what is a mucosa? What's the other name for a mucosa? Mucin. Well, mucin is the protein that is made that hydrates to become mucus. Is mucosa it is. Mucosa, okay, you guys are everything this. Mucosa is the noun. There you go. Mucosa is the noun. The adjective would be a oops, mucus membrane, right? Mucus is the adjective. Be careful. M U C U S is the noun. O U S is the adjective. Fun with vocabulary. So here I have mucus adjective describing the membrane. Mucosa noun is the name of the mucous membrane. So it's a mucous membrane. And remind me again where we find mucous membranes. Yes, you still Opening. get one later. Yes. Openings. Right, absolutely. Lining cavities that are open to the outside world. What organ systems are those associated with again? Integumentary. Well, no, not the integumentary. Digestive. Reproductive. Reproductive. 
respiratory and urinary. There you go, excellent. Those are the four. All four of those organ systems are open to the outside world. You are correct, our integumentary system is open to the outside world, but our skin isn't slippery and slimy with mucus, right? This isn't a mucous membrane. What membrane is this again? Yeah. Cutaneous membrane, there you go, excellent. It is our cutaneous membrane, absolutely. Our mucous membranes line those four cavities, uh, reproductive, digestive, respiratory, and urinary. So in those, because they're open to the outside world, we have clusters of lymphatic tissue to be those guards that help to protect us. I did not make it an assignment. However, I will tell you right now, and I'm gonna write this big bold letters and I'm gonna do it in red so that it points out. Uh, you guys had that interactive physiology a 2.0 assignment that I forced you guys to do for the cardiovascular system. The interactive physiology tutorial for the immune response is excellent, where it really does this great job of talking about the body as this castle and that we have to defend with soldiers, and it does a really, really great job of describing the immune response. I like it a lot. I didn't want to give it as an assignment, but I want to strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to look at that because it's going to be a really, really great resource that will help you to understand some of these more challenging concepts. All right. All right, let me leave that there for a second so you guys can see it. Interactive physiology 2.2, 2.0, immune response. All right, excellent. Now I can get rid of that and we can see, obviously we have the fluid, the lymph, and here we have a pretty picture, uh, not quite as pretty or not quite as artistic as the one we saw at the beginning of class today. Uh, but this one does a nice job of showing all of those components of the um, of lymphatic, including while it doesn't show the pyrus patches, it does show uh, one of the tonsils. And notice it also shows that appendix, which would also be considered a malt as well. All right. We've kind of already hit on this, the functions of the lymphatic system. It is to drain that excess interstitial fluid. As we learned in the first part of the class, our capillaries are leaky. There truly is an exchange of material that takes place where fluid and stuff come out at the arterial end and fluid and stuff re-enter the capillary at the venous end. But as we saw, there is a pressure difference at the arterial end, the pressure is 10 millimeters of mercury out, and at the venous end, it's only eight millimeters of mercury back in. So all of our capillaries are a little bit leaky, and not everything that sneaks out of the capillaries gets back in. So it is the job of the lymphatic system to take that fluid and dump it back into the cardiovascular. And does it, does, it, does it do it blindly where it just closes its eyes and grabs it and dumps it and ults to the best? No, of course not, right? It is going to also provide that defense. It is going to also play an important role in monitoring and regulating that fluid, looking for abnormal cells, looking for cancer cells, looking for pathogens, looking for things that can, uh, that can cause harm and provide some defense for us that way. Lastly, it also plays an important role in the transportation of uh, especially uh, lipid-based materials, dietary lipids, uh, lipid-soluble vitamins, and things along those lines from our gastrointestinal tract. It plays a role in, uh, uh, in uh, processing it, a, a, role, a role in transporting it. Because again, when you have that nice big cheeseburger for breakfast, do you want all the grease, all the fat from that going straight into your blood supply and being distributed throughout the blood in your body? No, so we need some way to be able to regulate and control the movement of those lipids. And so our lymphatic system plays an important role in that as well. All right, questions on that? And like I said, our lymphatic system, it's gonna be a great lead into what we're gonna talk about in the second part of this class, our immune response. And again, don't make me get up on my soapbox. We do not have an immune system. Organ systems are systems of the body comprised of organs working together for some centralized function. Your immune response is a chemical and cellular interaction that helps to provide the defenses for the body. 
There are certainly organs in the body that help to facilitate that process, but they do not form their own system. They just have an immune response. So, all right. Uh, yes, go ahead. It houses those lycocytes that, that are not in the bloodstream. Uh, yes. So remember when we talked about the, the, about um, only about two percent of the leukocytes are in circulation at any one time, and absolutely, lymph nodes are one of the places where they're housed. But so is the spleen, and so is the liver, and so is the bone marrow. Uh, so, but again, are also lymphatic vessels. So you're right. Many of these lymphatic vessels house them. Uh, the thymus, as we'll learn, plays an important role in the maturation of them. So again, that's why we talk about the immune response and the lymphatic system together because they definitely work hand in hand, or the lymphatic system is the organ system that provides much of the support for our immune response. But it's just not an immune system, that's all. All right, and like you said, the fluid inside of the uh, lymphatic vessels is lymph. Uh, really, in many ways, lymph is, is partially a locational name. If you think about it, that little bit of water that has a little bit of sodium in it that is sitting in the blood vessel, we call it plasma. The second it leaves that blood vessel into the uh, tissue, it becomes interstitial fluid. And the second that that drop of water with that sodium ends up in a lymphatic vessel, we call it lymph, All right? So kind of plasma, interstitial fluid, and lymph are really kind of, in one way, they are three names for fluid based on its location. But there are some differences. Obviously, there are formed elements inside of our blood in, with, the, with that plasma, right? So uh, there are uh, large proteins inside there and things that, like that shouldn't be in the interstitial fluid. Our lymph is going to have more lipids in it and things along those lines. So it's not completely interchangeable, but a lot of it is. As I mentioned, that lymph moves in just one direction. It is slow because it doesn't have that centralized pump. There is no heart that moves it, right? It's dealing with low pressure fluid. So it has to rely on many of the same tricks that our veins do to get this fluid back to the heart. Things like one-way valves, things like our skeletal muscle pumps, things like our respiratory pumps. So the same things that help the veins to get blood back, uh, lymphatic vessels take advantage of as well. In fact, lymphatic vessels typically have, oops, wrong button. Lymphatic vessels actually typically have more valves. Than veins. Wow, why is this so large? Oh, it's because I was writing before, there we go. Lymphatic vessels have even more valves than veins to help in this process. However, there is one thing that our lymphatic vessels do that our veins don't, and that is peristalsis. Remind me again what peristalsis is? Rhythmic movement. Excellent. I love that. Absolutely. It is rhythmic contractions of the smooth muscle. Right? Lymphatic vessels, like arteries, like veins, have smooth muscle that lines the lumen, that lines the vessel. However, unlike arteries and unlike veins, our larger lymphatic vessels are actually able to do rhythmic contractions of that, and those rhythmic contractions are for propulsion of that fluid. And those rhythmic contractions for propulsion of fluid we call peristalsis. In fact, most of the hollow organs in our body undergo peristalsis to move substances. Arteries and veins are kind of unique in that they don't. Give me examples of other vessels in the body, other structures in the body that use peristalsis to move substances. Yeah, yeah the entire digestive system, our esophagus, our stomach, our large intestine, our small intestine, absolutely. What Reprodu else? Reproductive system too. Reproductive system, right? Uh, peristalsis plays a role in the expulsion of the menses for females. Uh, it also uh, orgasm and the uh, and some of the chemical signals in the male semen can actually cause a reverse peristalsis of the female's uterus to help to draw the sperm up to the eggs. Absolutely excellent. Give me one more. Mm. 
What other system uses peristalsis? I know you know. Respiratory system? No. Urinary? Yeah, urinary system. It's the urinary system, absolutely, right? And not just the urethra for the release of urine. And again, it's tricky because when you first start to urinate or to void your urine, really, micturate is the correct term for that, uh, the pressure of the bladder keeps, tends to keep the flow of the urine stream continuous. However, as the bladder empties, what happens to the stream of urine that comes out? It becomes more pulsatile in nature. Also, the movement of the urine from the kidneys to the bladder, right? The kidneys are above the bladder, so it would you know, be easy to think that gravity would just carry it to the bladder. But does that mean if you're doing a headstand, your blood, I mean, your urine can't get to your bladder? And what about those poor astronauts who are out of space for months and months? Do they never get to urinate because they have no gravity to pull their urine to their bladder? No, of course not. Are your readers undergo peristalsis as well to move that urine from our kidneys to our bladder? So yeah, pretty much any hollow organ in, the, in our body is going to use peristalsis. Like I said, the arteries and veins are really the exception. All right. Questions on that? And like I said, it is a relatively slow process, only about two to three liters per day. But again, that's about all that leaks out of our capillaries. So it serves its purpose well. All right. Like our blood vessels, lymphatic vessels come in different sizes and different characteristics. The smallest and the most specialized are the capillaries. Obviously, capillaries are going to be somewhat similar to blood vessel capillaries, but they're also going to be very different in some very key ways. And we'll talk about what those are in just a minute. Those capillaries' job is to collect that interstitial fluid and feed them into what we call collecting vessels. Collecting vessels feed the blood into and out of the lymph nodes. So let's do some quick math here. Here is a lymph node, excellent. And so, as I said, some of our collecting vessels are going to feed lymph into the lymph nodes, and some of our collecting vessels are going to feed lymph out of a lymph node. And what might a good term we use for the collecting vessels that feed lymph into? So it's going into our lymph node kind of like this arrow is pointing into our lymph node, what might a good term for that type of a collecting vessel be? Afferent, excellent. So it's gonna be an afferent collecting vessel that carries it into the lymph node, like that arrow going in and coming out. What would we wanna call that one? Efferent. Efferent, excellent. So when we talk about our collecting vessels, really we have two flavors of uh, collecting vessels, afferent and efferent, that are feeding it into and out of our uh, lymph nodes. These collecting vessels are gonna continue to merge together, kind of like our veins merge together into bigger and bigger veins. And as they uh, merge together all from all the different parts of the body, they come together to form a total of nine trunks. We need to identify those nine trunks. We need to know what parts of the body are drained by those nine trunks. And some of them are paired and some of them, one of them is not. We'll talk about those. And these nine trunks then feed into one of two ducts. And these two ducts are then going to drain the lymph into the veins. Right before it reaches the heart. And more specifically, there are two ducts they feed into the right and the left subclavian veins. So if a blood vessel, right, if the lymph, let's say it this way, was to be deposited into that right subclavian vein, from there, how would it get back to the heart? 
to the vein, cephalic. Right, cephalic trunk. Okay, so the exactly the right cephalic, uh, pardon me, the right subclavian vein feeds into the right brachiocephalic, not a trunk though, vein. Vein. And then that feeds into the superior vena, vena cava, which feeds into the right, right atrium. Right atrium. Excellent. See, and you thought you were done with the cardiovascular system. Nope. All right. Excellent. Questions on that? All right. Here is uh, some of the pretty pictures. I like this uh, kind of flow chart from your uh, textbook because, again, it does a nice job of showing uh, this circular circulation pattern of the blood vessels. Our arteries carrying it away from the heart, veins carrying it back. And here we have this capillary bed in the center. And in that capillary bed in the center, notice interdigitated with it is where the lymphatic capillaries are. After all, if it's the blood capillary that is leaky, that is where you're gonna want the lymphatic vessels to pick up the excess fluid. Notice it carries it back into uh, afferent and efferent uh, vessels, collecting vessels, feeding into uh, and through veins, uh, pardon me, valves. Notice here we have an example of the valve, so we're going through those valves, feeding into a lymph node, out the lymph node through multiple lymph nodes until it finally gets back to a trunk, one of those nine trunks that again, we will identify and you will be responsible for on the exam, on an illustration, on a model or a chart or something along those lines, uh, which will feed into one of two ducts. And it feeds into the venous system, like we said, right at either the left or right subclavian vein, right before it reaches the heart. I like this picture of the capillary bed showing again how they're interdigitated, but there is, and I think I've got it on the next slide. Okay, actually, I don't quite have it on the next slide, but I think it's the one after this, so we'll talk about it here. Here again, we get a little bit of a closer up view of that blood vessel capillary bed and these lymphatic capillaries, and we can see there are some key differences. While the capillary beds are these big, massive mesh-like structures, our lymphatic capillaries, as you can see, are long blunt shaped structures. So they're like a long blunt shaped finger like extension that sticks out. But what's cool about these blunt finger like capillary extensions is the endothelial cells that form them. Notice they're comprised of simple squamous uh, epithelial cells. And what happens is two things the epithelial cells overlap with each other. So instead of having just a continuous endothelium, we have this overlapping endothelium where the cells overlap over the top of each other. And these are only loosely held in place. As it turns out, just one end of the epithelial cell is actually anchored to the surrounding tissues. So think about what happens here and let's cheat and get rid of my first drawing and make this a blood vessel. So here we have a blood vessel and from this blood vessel some fluid is released. Some of the blood plasma, some of the water with some stuff in it is released. Of course, when this fluid fills this space, we get an increase in the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid because fluid pushes against its boundaries. And as the fluid pushes against the boundary of this epithelial cell, if only one side of the epithelial cell is anchored in place, then what's gonna happen is that epithelial cell is gonna swing open. And when it swings open, that fluid is going to come inside. Of course, once that fluid comes inside, 
we have the issue of we get an increase in the hydrostatic pressure of uh, the lymphatic vessel here because this what's filling with water so water's pushing against its boundary and as water pushes against its boundary here water pushes against that flap and when it pushes against the flap guess what the flap does close the flap closes so basically oops that wasn't quite oh, let's undo that one I don't need that. there you go it closes again basically what we've got here is a one-way trap door fluid can get in but it can't get out and so as the hydrostatic pressure continues to increase as more and more fluid fills this space it has no choice but to travel down the capillary away from the opening and travel back towards the collecting vessels. And so in this way, we have these one-way trap doors where fluid, and again, notice because these are big, loose endothelial tissues, not only can the interstitial fluid gets in, but also large molecules, oops, pathogens, cells, right? And the key with the cells is, yes, yeah, some of them will be just dead and damaged cells, in which case they can be broken down and destroyed, but we can also get abnormal cells in here as well, right? Like cancer cells, and that's one of the issues. When cancer cells get into your lymphatic system, where eventually is it gonna end up? Everywhere. You're right, it's gonna, uh, you're right, absolutely. It's gonna end up in your blood supply. And once it gets in your blood supply, absolutely, it can go everywhere. So one of the first things when you're diagnosed with cancer is they take a long, hard look at your lymph nodes to see, has this started to spread throughout your body? So this is both good and bad that all these large things can get in there because we're gonna be able to filter, we're gonna be able to monitor it, we're gonna be able to regulate and do something about it but it also can be a pathway for things that we don't want to get around the body to get around the body. So, okay. Go ahead. So all this uh, stuff that gets lymphatic system, it bring to the vein. Yes, it is eventually going to bring it back. Cause again, remember it's this fluid is fluid that leaked out of the cardiovascular system. So we want to put it back into the cardiovascular system. And so it came out of the out of the capillary, and then we put it back into the subclavian veins. Okay. Yep. All right. Let's take a look at the pretty words that say all these things. So again, we have these large, blunt-ended vessels that are large in diameter, because we know a large diameter means low pressure, easy flow. And we have these one-way flaps, these overlapping epithelial cells that allow for that one-way movement of fluid into the capillary, but it can't get back out. And I'm pretty sure I have a pretty, I thought I had a good picture of this. Nope, I guess I do, I do, we'll get to it in a second. All right, now these are our typical lymphatic capillaries, but there is one additional special type of lymphatic capillary. Remember, one of the things that we said, one of the important functions of the lymphatic system is to collect those lipid-soluble vitamins, those large lipids from our digestive system, and monitor and regulate, and even in some cases, modify those before they get into the blood supply. The way we're able to do that in our digestive system is by having these large, very specialized ca lymphatic capillaries known as lacteals. I know we haven't talked about the anatomy of the small intestine yet, but hopefully one of the things you know about our small intestine is our small intestine is specialized for absorption. And it is specialized for absorption. One of those specializations is these long finger-like extensions of the uh, mucosa 
and submucosa known as villi. So we have these villi that stick out, increasing the surface area. In the center of those villi, you can see is where we have the blood vessel capillaries to absorb most of our nutrients. But we also have that lacteal. And that lacteal is where we're going to be able to absorb lipid soluble materials. So it's where our lipid soluble dietary substances are absorbed and travel back in a different place than just depositing it straight into our blood supply. All right, and then we'll follow the path of that back to our heart as well. All righty. There's my pretty picture. I knew I had it here somewhere. So notice we have these nice overlapping epithelial cells where only one end of it is anchored. So again, what can happen is that as the pressure increases, that gets pushed inward. And as the pressure increases here, it pushes it back outward. And so it again forms that one-way door where, again, the uh, fluid can get in, but it can't get out. All right, questions on that? All right, stunned silence, excellent. That's what I love to hear. So here we see examples of some of these collecting their fluid. Notice again, things like uh, white blood cells, other large proteins, lipids, things like that can get into these. And because the one-way flow of fluid, that forces the fluid to continue on its path back towards the heart into those collecting vessels. Those collecting vessels, again, have the valves to help and assist. And as I mentioned, they lead into and out of our lymph nodes. So our afferent and efferent. And notice, again, in some ways, it is a subjective term. This collecting vessel right here is obviously efferent to this lymph node, but it is afferent to that lymph node. So it is somewhat of a subjective term when we're using afferent and efferent in this way. As I said, their function is similar to veins, so not surprisingly, their anatomy is similar to veins. They have those same three tunics like all veins, so a tunica intima, which is made up of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Uh, it's got a tunica media uh, that has the smooth muscle and a tunica externa. Uh, that is a fibrous connective tissue that helps to hold it in place. I know your book gives us this picture here uh, and again, what it's trying to show is the size of the lumen, but notice they don't bother showing the other layers. They just show the epithelial tissue. So it is a thinner wall, but they don't show the layers the same way as the veins do. And like I said, typically it has more internal valves than the veins as well, and more anastomoses. Excellent. And like I pointed out, uh, the larger vessels will use peristalsis. Let's talk about some of those larger vessels. As I mentioned, there are nine trunks that are the largest, second largest vessels that come out of the collecting vessels that accumulate together. Most are paired. What does it mean to be paired again? Left and right. Left and right. Again, despite many of my warnings, I know my 430 class did it, and I've only started grading a couple of your 431s, but a lot of people are, well, okay, I can't say a lot of people. In 430, a lot of people lost points because they forgot, despite all my warnings, to put left and right, to put left and right. You gotta put left and right when appropriate if these things are paired. Same thing is true here. We have to talk about left and right when they're paired. Let's start easy. Uh, inferiorly, uh, some of the paired ones. So again, we have a left and a right. Let's do it this way. The first are the lumbar trunks. Where do you think the lumbar trunks receive their lymph from? They're paired. One's here. One's here. 
Where do you think they receive their lymph from? True, the lumbar region is not a bad guess, but where beyond that? The lower limb. Legs, exactly. It receives lymph from the legs. Excellent. All right. The next paired uh, trunks are the, um, let's go with the jugular. Where, uh, trunks, where do you think they receive their lymph from? The head. There you go. Excellent. We have the subclavian trunks. Where do you think they receive lymph from? Arms. Um, yeah. There's always that alphabet soup term you're going to have to worry about having to spell. In this case, it's bronchomediastinal. But remember, anytime you have one of these alphabet soup terms that you need to be able to decipher, it tells you everything about it. Bronco refers to what? Lungs. Lungs. Mediastinum refers to what? Heart. Cardiac. Well, how about the, the central Middle region of, of the here. thoracic cavity? Yes. Right? Excellent, right? So again, this is basically the left side and the right side of the thoracic cavity that we have there. So two, four, six, eight. But remember there is nine trunks and the one unpaired trunk comes from where? We've done arms, we've done legs, we've done thoracic cavity, we've done head. What are we missing? Abdominal. Abdominal pelvic cavity, which primarily contains what? Intestinal. Digestive organs, remember? And as we talked about, our digestive organs, and really all the abdominal pelvic cavity, But remember, in particular, our digestive organs, especially those that are involved in absorbing, we have those lacteals. So this is a very lipid, um, dense lymph. And this lipid dense lymph is carried back by an unpaired trunk known as the intestinal trunk. Now notice the intestinal trunk, that unpaired trunk is located down here. And notice that all three of our inferior trunks feed into a specialized structure. And that specialized structure is known as the cisterna chile. The cisterna chile is this enlargement right here this enlargement right here, where all three of these trunks, so the two uh, lumbar trunks and the intestinal trunk all feed into it. And this cisterna chile is going to house some of those large lipids. It can house, and in some cases, even able to modify large lipids. Uh, and then obviously uh, can then release them uh, into, from there into the, uh, into the duct, which will then of course carry it into the blood. So that's a sterna of chili is an important uh, digestive structure to help to again, help us to regulate and modify those lipids before they get dumped into the cardiovascular region. Uh, but before, maybe before the, yeah, into the cardiovascular system. All right. So here we see those. So again, we have the lumbar, the bronchomediastinal, the subclavian, the jugular, and that singular unpaired intestinal trunk. Now, four right, four left. So you would expect there to be a fair amount of symmetry with the ducts. Oh, and here's another pretty picture that again shows these really, really nicely. So again, here I'll use my highlighter. 
So here is the uh, ju uh, jugular, subclavian, bronchomediastinal coming up that way. Right. And then like we talked about, we have the two lumbars and the intestinal feeding into, I guess this is the intestinal, I don't know what the heck that's supposed to be, artistic license, uh, feeding into the cisterna chile. All right, so we did that. Now, it would make sense for there to be a lot of symmetry on how these feed into the two large ducts, but it turns out there isn't. The first duct is what is known as the right subclavian a duct. It is the duct. Its job is to feed the blood, pardon me, the lymph into the blood in the uh, right subclavian vein, so it is the right subclavian duct, and that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. However, you have to look really closely at this picture to see it, because that's it right there. Right, that little dot I'm putting right there is it. While it is large in diameter, it is not large in length. It is a tiny in length vessel. So I'll erase that so we can get, again, a better look at that. And notice, oops, I didn't want to do that. So do, 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 do. Perfect, that works. Notice the right subclavian duct is very short. And it only receives lymph from the right jugular, the right subclavian, and the right bronchomediastinal. So when we think of terms of the regions of the body that are drained by the right subclavian duct, what are the regions of the body that are drained by the right subclavian duct? Head. The whole head? Uh, right side. Right side of the head. Not the right head, right? You don't have two heads. Right side of the head. <laughs> what else? Right arm. right arm. Right arm. And where else? Right lung. Oh, okay. How about right side of the thoracic cavity? So when you say is drained by the right subclavian duct is it are you saying it's going from that to these regions or it's coming no, it's, from it's drained region? by so lymph comes out of these regions so lymph comes out of the the out of the right side of the thoracic cavity it comes up and feeds into the right subclavian duct Okay. Lymph from the right arm comes back via the right subclavian trunk and feeds into the right subclavian duct. Okay, I got it. Lymph from the right side of the head feeds into the right jugular trunk, which feeds into the right subclavian duct. All right. So notice, and again, this is one of the things that people get messed up on the exams, two different types of questions here. I could ask you what vessels directly feed into the right subclavian duct. I could also ask you what regions of the body are drained by the right subclavian duct. And those are not the same answers, right? The vessels that feed into it are the right jugular, the right subclavian, and the right bronchomediastinal. The regions of the body that are drained by it are the right side of the head, the right arm, and the right side of the thoracic cavity. All right, questions on that? We've learned one other thing as well. If we have a right subclavian duct, guess what the other one is called? Left. Left subclavian duct. That would make a lot of sense, but that isn't what we've learned in this class. What have we learned in this class? Is that anatomist hate us? So guess what the name of the other one is? Thoracic duct. Thoracic duct. Exactly. All right. Because anatomists hate us. Now, if we look at that thoracic duct, and I think I have a better picture. So we don't call it left thoracic duct, duct, just thoracic duct. Correct. So why isn't the other one just the lymphatic duct or the subclavian duct? I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, we have a right lymphatic duct and a thoracic duct. That's what we have. 
All right. The, oh, I thought I had a, let's go back here. So this, so hold on, let's start over. Here in purple, that right there, that tiny thing right there again, ding, 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 is the right lymphatic duct. However, and let's use orange for this one, our thoracic duct starts at the cisterna chile, goes all the way up the thoracic cavity, and then finally feeds into the subclavian vein, the left subclavian vein. So notice tremendous asymmetry in the sizes of these two ducts. And we can also clearly see that it is going to drain like the right lymphatic duct. It is gonna drain the left side of the head from the left jugular, the left arm from the left subclavian, the left side of the thoracic cavity with the left bronchomediastinal, so those three are the same as this one, but because the thoracic duct starts at the cisterna chile, it also drains both legs from the lumbar trunks and the abdominal pelvic cavity from the intestinal trunk. So we have this big, huge asymmetry in which trunks feed into which ducts, Yes, I'm sorry, it's, it's the lymphatic, right lymphatic duct. I know I said subclavian, I misspoke, I apologize. It is the right lymphatic duct. So yes, the right lymphatic duct is the correct term, I apologize. One of the problems with trying to write and draw and talk at the same time is I'm not one of those people that can chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. And so uh, sometimes I don't catch myself when I mis misspeak. Uh, so it's the right lymphatic duct. So I apologize, I didn't, uh, I misspoke. I think that's what threw me off early. Yeah, no problem, I apologize. Then yeah, mention something sooner because Sometimes I get going and I stop paying attention. All right, so we have this pretty picture that again does a nice job of showing that asymmetry in how the two ducts drain lymph from our body. The right lymphatic duct just from the right side of the head, just from the right arm, just from the right side of the thoracic cavity and everything else into the thoracic duct. Again, there's some symmetry, right? left head, left trunk, I mean left uh, thoracic cavity, left arm, but the abdominal pelvic and the legs all through the thoracic. All righty. Now, again, along those paths, we have our lymph nodes. But, and again, it's one of those things, lymph nodes can be found randomly all sorts of different places. But, and again, this is where I have to work on my analogies. Uh, normally we're sitting in a classroom and if we were sitting in a classroom and we wanted to protect ourselves from something harmful outside, we'd just we randomly place guards, just random places within the classroom? No, you would put them by the doors, the entry and exit points, because those are the places that are most vulnerable. So not surprising, our lymph nodes, while they can be located in random locations throughout the body, they tend to be clustered together, especially like in joint areas, like in the axillary region, like in the uh, antecubital region, like in the inguinal region, like in the cervical region. So notice we have all these different types uh, and clusters, like the cervical nodes and the axillary nodes and the inguinal nodes, and those types of things that are gonna all be present. Oops. Uh, and clustered together as they carry those back. So again, here we see those lymph nodes, here we see the different regions of the body, the trunks, the ducts, and all that fun stuff all together. Again, the goal is to get this stuff back into the blood, our water, our ions, our lipids, nutrients and waste, plasma proteins. But like I said, this lymph can also um, be a pathway for harmful things, cancer cells, cellular debris, damage in dead cells, viruses and bacteria, other harmful pathogens can use our lymphatic system as well. All right, how are we doing on time? We're doing good on time. This is a good place to go ahead and take our first break. Uh, it is 1.20 right now. We still have a little bit to talk about, but uh, we'll still have plenty of time to form our groups and pick our discussions. So let's go ahead and take our first break. It's 1.20 right now. So we will restart at 1.35, and I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions before we take our first break? 
All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the lymph nodes, their anatomy and their function. As we talked about, their job is to filter that lymph on its way back, monitoring it for harmful or abnormal materials. As I said, we're not gonna just spread these randomly throughout the body. They're gonna be clumped together in clusters uh, at important junctions or other locations. Uh, yes, that's a great way of describing it. It can help to uh, help, I guess it's the, not necessarily the right word, but yes, it can facilitate the metastasizing of cancer cells. If cancer cells end up into the lymphatic vessels, the lymphatic vessels can carry it ultimately back to the cardiovascular system where it could then spread anywhere in the body. Uh, this is how um, cancer is like melanomas of the skin can end up in places like the lungs, like the heart, it can even affect the brain. Absolutely, it's one of the ways that they're able to spread in that fashion. So like we talked about uh, before the break, uh, we have uh, clusters of them in the cervical area. And again, this is definitely something that we thought about. A lot of people get that swelling. Uh, you can feel the lymph nodes when they're swollen as a result of that. Uh, axillary nodes are another uh, location where they occur. Again, this is another one you see, especially in little kids. In little kids, sometimes when they get a cold, you see this big, large lump under their, uh, in their armpit uh, from those uh, superficial uh, axillary nodes uh, swelling as a result of that. The inguinal locations, and then also uh, there are both pelvic and lumbar clusters uh, for these as well. So again, you can find them in random locations, uh, but they also tend to cluster together in these main regions as well. They're able to monitor the condition of the lymph because they house defense cells. All of our uh, leukocytes can be found in a lymph node, but primarily the lymph nodes uh, contain two types of uh, leukocytes. The first are our monocytes. Remember our monocytes, as we talked about, uh, have the ability uh, when they are out of the blood supply to be activated. And when they're activated, uh, we call them the macrophages. They are our big eaters. And their responsibility is to be able to engulf and digest large amounts of material. Remember, we also briefly hinted at how their job is not just to digest that stuff, but also express it on the surface, so we called them antigen presenting cells when we were talking about blood typing, and we'll talk more about that next week. The other primary type of leukocyte that you find in the lymph nodes are the lymphocytes, as the name might indicate. Those lymphocytes are the ones that provide our immune response to antigens, and they play an important role in producing our antibodies and also forming those uh, cytotoxic killer T cells that are going to be able to help us to destroy harmful and abnormal things in our body. And again, we'll talk a lot about this when we talk about our immune response next week. So like I said, all of our leukocytes can be found in lymph nodes, but primarily there are large amounts of lymphocytes and monocytes that are activated as to macrophages. And we'll actually see they're located in different regions of our lymph node as well. Lymph nodes can vary in size, anywhere from one to 25 millimeters in diameter. Uh, they have a kidney bean shape, and by that, uh, no, if you think about it, both, both, if you think about it, both the uh, monocytes and the lymphocytes are agranular. So they're both, uh, so like I said, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread your question. Yes, remember, it will house all of our types, but primarily it contains the two agranular sites the lymphocytes and the monocytes. All right, they have a kidney bean shape. What that means is they have a convex surface and then they also have a concave surface. This is a type of anatomy we're going to see a lot in this class, where we see this, where we've got a convex and a concave surface to them. Uh, the lungs have this anatomy, obviously the kidneys have this anatomy and so on and so forth. When we do this, as we will see, this indented region of the organ where that concave uh, shape is, is what is known as the hilum. 
this hillum, as you can see from the um, illustration to the side, is where the blood vessels and the nerves are going to enter into the lymph node. So this is where the BVs and the nerves are going to enter, and that's way too big, so let's make that a little smaller. The blood vessels and nerves are going to enter in the hilum. Notice also we have our collecting vessels. The collecting vessels that feed into the convex surface are the afferents. Smaller. I'll go ahead and mute that. Um, and then coming out of the hilum is also going to be where you will get. There you go, the efferent vessels. Now, notice in my illustration and also the one from your textbook, there are more, oops, afferent than efferent vessels. Why might that be important? There's more to go out than in. Right, and what happens if you have more things coming in than you have going out? Then it fills up and expands too much. Well, okay. You do have the right idea, it does fill up. We actually have a fancy term for that. The fancy term for that is congestion, all right? My favorite example of this is Highway 80. It could be 3.30 in the morning on a Wednesday. You're coming home from the bars in San Francisco. And again, it's 80 uh, that you're taking back. So you're going 80 miles an hour until you hit Davis. Again, even though it's four o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday at Davis, you run into traffic and everything slows it down to a crawl. And why is that? What happens at Davis? Interstate 80 goes from 40 lanes down to two, right? And that's what happens. You have that congestion that takes place as you're going through there. And that congestion, as it goes down into that, you have more things coming in and less going out. Things get congested in that area and things slow down. And that's really the key. What this does is it slows the flow of the lymph. And that gives more time for processing. Right, this way the lymph isn't rushing through the lymph node it's sluggishly chugging along inside the lymph node and that gives us more time to be able to process it properly and inspect it and thoroughly make sure that everything is okay. So again, we have those afferent and efferent and like I said, there are more afferent than there are efferent. Here we have a nice illustration that does a good job of showing the anatomy. And again, this is anatomy we are not too unfamiliar with. Uh, we will start out here with the fibrous capsule. We have this fibrous capsule, which is the outer layer, the protective covering of the lymph node uh, that is going to protect it and also going to help to anchor it in place so that these things don't move around inside of your body. However, I do want to point out, if you notice, there are some extensions of the uh, fibrous capsule that penetrate down deep into uh, the lymph node. These extensions of the fibrous capsule are what is known as the trabecula. Trabecula being singular, trabeculae being plural. So these trabeculae, do that, do that. These trabeculae are extensions, and they also play a role in helping to compartmentalize. There we go. Compartmentalize the uh, lymph node. 
again, helping to slow things down, helping to uh, make it more maze-like, which again is going to help to slow the movement of the lymph as it passes through it. We then have this uh, organization we're familiar with from uh, many times before, where we have a, a candy-coated outer shell and a chewy nougat center. When we have that type of an organization, an outer layer and an inner layer, what do we call the outer layer again? External. True, the external is one of the terms, but, but for instance, our uh, kidney is going to have Cortex. it. Cortex. Cortex, and excellent. And the inside is called the? Medulla. Medulla, absolutely. And that is what we have here as well. We have this outer region, which is the cortex, and I'll go ahead and highlight this in yellow. This region out here is the cortex. Notice it is the cortex that is divided up into compartments by the trabeculae. Also the cortex, and I'm going to switch to a solid pen here. A cortex has this, and actually let's make it bigger, is identified by this large cluster of cells. This large cluster of cells is a structure we call the lymphatic uh, follicle, or it is also known as, uh, so we can call it a follicle, or we can also refer to them as um, uh, lymphatic nodules. So the cortex contains, oops, it's not writing. The lymphatic follicles, or you can also use the term lymphatic nodule. Right. These have a very distinct anatomy to them. Notice they are very dark and dense with cells in the outer portion, but it has a very light colored central region. That light colored central region, it is what is known as the germinal center of that lymphatic nodule or follicle. And these lymphatic nodules are what house the lymphocytes. Now, they're in a normal healthy individual, as I said, these follicles have this distinct shape and characteristic to them. But should a harmful pathogen be identified, then what do you think happens in that germinal center? The name like germinal center, what does germinal refer to? What does that term mean? I don't know either, so we'll just move on. Germ or something. Germ is not a bad case, but what does it mean, for instance, if you like plants, one of the things you may do to your plants is help them to germinate. What does it mean to germinate? Start growing. Well, I like produce, produce, grow, give birth to. Exactly. That's exactly what's going to happen here. What's going to happen in these germinal centers are we are going to start to produce massive numbers of these lymphocytes. And that, of course, is going to cause our follicle to grow. And when our follicle grows, our lymph nodes swell. That swelling of the lymph nodes that we get when we get infected is because of the massive production of cells that occurs by activating these lymphatic follicles. So these lymphatic follicles, are their job is to grow. And they're also the ones that are going to make the antibodies. What do antibodies do again? Well, uh, protect. Correct. Right. They help to, well, they help us to recognize things that aren't us. We talked about how they attach themselves to those blood vessels, clumping the blood vessels together. Attached to but the, the other thing they do by attaching themselves to the outside of the cell is they're like a flag that waves that say, hey, I don't belong. Look at me. And so if you think about this, I've made a bit of miss of a mess of this picture. So let me go ahead and erase this a little bit. If you think about what's going to happen here, lymph comes in. As this lymph comes in, right, it passes through the spaces, passes through these sinuses. We'll identify these sinuses in just a minute. And as it's doing that, it's coming in contact with all these lymphocytes. 
And these lymphocytes, if they recognize it being abnormal, can plant one of those antibody flags on it. So that as that substance comes to the medulla, this is where our monocytes are. This is where our macrophages are located. And those flags of antibodies are waving to say, hey, I don't belong. And those are exactly the kind of things that monocytes like to grab onto and eat, right? So that lymphocyte is putting the stick on the popsicle so that the monocyte can eat it, right? And as Jessica pointed out, so when that lymph node swells, that's actually a good thing. That means that your body is building up a defense. Well, I mean, it's not good in that it means you have an infection, but it is good in that it means your body is fighting to uh, defeat that pathogen and make you better again. All right. Notice also, if you've looked at your anatomy list, which hopefully you haven't, you've printed it out and started looking at that study guide for it. If you have not, then first and foremost, shame on you. Uh, but you'll notice that there are some spaces. So if we follow the path of our lymph, it comes into the lymph node from the afferent vessel into what space? What space might this be right here, just below the fibrous capsule? So uh capsular there you go not subscapular i know everybody wants to say subscapular because they remember the bones no you're absolutely correct subcapsular sinus from there it goes into the spaces that runs alongside of the trabecula what might that space be trabecular sinus there you go so there it goes into the big spaces formed by the large fibers found in the medulla region Notice the medulla does not have any follicles. Instead, it has this big, huge, thick mesh-like structure formed by the medullary cords, as we'll see. And what do you think we call those spaces between the medullary cords? Medullary sinus. Medullary sinuses. And then from the medullary sinuses, that lymph leaves out the efferent vessel. So notice it takes this nice meandering path through the lymph node, nice and slow, rubbing itself up against all the immune cells, giving us a chance to monitor that lymph, cleanse that lymph, and if need be, set up an alarm, like Ryan pointed out. Set up those alarm cells to say, hey, there's something bad in the body right now we need to do something about. Subcapsular feeds into the trabecular sinus. All right, so again, we talked about the follicles or nodules. Again, either of those terms is acceptable. The medulla doesn't have the follicles. That's how you can tell them apart histologically. But it does have big, large cords. And within those cords are the sinuses. And like I said, this is the space where you find the macrophages. The illustration does an OK job of showing this. But I think, actually, if we look at the light microscopy, it actually does a better job when you look at this under the microscope. Notice very clearly, we can see the fibrous capsule out here on the outer surface. Notice we have this extension of the fibrous capsule that penetrates deep down into the lymph node. What might this extension be called? Trabecula, trabeculae. Excellent. Excellent. All of these circular structures, what are these? Lymphatic, nod lymphatic nodules or lymphatic follicles. Notice the center of these lymphatic follicles are very light in color. What would the light color central region of this follicle be? Terminal center. Germinal center. Germinal center, excellent. And notice the follicles are only in this part up here. So what region of the lymph node would this whole entire part be here? Well, region of the sinus. cortex. No, absolutely. This is the cortex, right? Whereas this part down here without the lymphatic nodules would be what? Medulla. The medulla. And notice the medulla has these big, thick, uh, linear structures. What might these big, thick, linear structures of our medulla be? Cords. The cords. And the spaces in between those cords, what might that be? Sinuses. Sinuses, medullary sinuses. What cells are you going to find in the medulla primarily? 
macrophages. macrophages. Macrophages, those activated monocytes. And what cells do you primarily find in the nodules? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. There you go. See how easy that is? Perfect. I have a question. I have an answer. Um, you were using the uh, words lymphatic nodules and lymphoid follicles inter interchangeably. Are they the same thing? Yeah, the follicle and nodule are interchangeable terms. Okay, thank yeah, you. Both are accepted. Right, like anterior and ventral, they mean the exact same thing. All righty. Any other questions on the histology on this? I think I have all the, I think we hit everything that was on the histology for this. Any questions on that? All right, excellent. Here we see a great electron microscopy view of the uh, medullary region, where again, we see those uh, medullary cords and those big open sinus spaces. And notice, like I said, this is where we're gonna find the big, huge macrophages uh, this is going to be where we find other cells in here as well. And remember, the type of tissue that makes our lymph nodes is that reticular connective tissue. Reticular connective tissue is made up of reticular fibers. And what protein makes these reticular fibers again? Reticular fibers are short, elaborately branched protein. And what protein is made up, uh, are these reticular fibers made up of again? Well, if I wasn't certain, then I should probably guess the most common protein found in the body, which, as Alexa would point out, would indeed be collagen. Excellent. All righty. I love this. So again, the electron microscopy view is good. We, that's cool. I love uh, the high magnification light microscopy. Because here with the high magnification light microscopy, you really see a nice, get a nice job of seeing these reticular fibers, these short, elaborately branched reticular fibers. And notice you see all the nuclei of all the different leukocytes that are found in this region. Remember way back in 430 when we were talking about connective tissues, one of the things we said is the nice thing about connective tissues are all our connective tissues look very, very different from each other. And this one to me, these, this reticular connective tissue always reminds me of like a cherry blossom tree. I don't know if any of you ever spend any time back east or in Washington or things along those lines. They have these beautiful cherry blossom trees. And this is always, always reminiscent of it to me. All right. So there you go. I think that covers everything that we needed to know from a histology standpoint for the lymph nodes. Questions on that? All right. So as I mentioned, again, it enters in the convex side, those afferent vessels. Again, it goes into the subcapsular space, into the trabec I mean sinus, into the trabecular sinus, into the medullary sinuses. And then from there, it is going to leave out uh, the efferent vessels. So again, it's this nice, long, meandering path. It's not a straight shoot through. We have more coming in than we have going out. Because again, our job is to delay the lymph in this lymph node give it time to be swished around, give it time to be sampled, give it time to come in contact with those immune cells so that we are monitoring the condition of that fluid before we stick it back into the blood supply. All righty, questions on that? Yeah, uh, Jessica's got a great example, sure. It's like the security gate at the airport. They don't just let anybody just walk up to the gates anymore. Now there's all these hoops you have to jump through first. All right, you have to take off your shoes, right? You have to walk through that big x-ray machine, all sorts of other things you have to do before you can get it to the other side. And that's why you don't show up 15 minutes before your, you know, at the airport 15 minutes before your flight takes off. Because it takes time to jump through all the hoops that you get to before you can get to the other side. But once you get to the other side, you can get on an airport and go anywhere you want in the country. Exactly. That's a great example. I like that a lot. All righty, and more pretty pictures. I think we got all that. Excellent. So lymph nodes are definitely one of the major uh, organs of the lymphatic system, but there are other lymphatic tissues as well, other clusters of these lymphatic nodules. And that I would say is gonna be the one challenge. Let's actually go back a couple pictures. 
to here. This is what I want. The one tricky part to this section is that basically all lymphatic follicles look like this. Now that you've seen one, you've seen all of them. However, this lymphatic follicle looks the same, but it can also be found in the tonsils. It can also be found in the spleen. It can also be found uh, in other regions, the pyrus patches in the small intestine. So if all of our lymphatic follicles look like this, how are we gonna tell if we're looking at the spleen or we're looking at the lymph node or we're looking at the small intestine or we're looking at a tonsil? We're not. We're screwed on the exam because we're not going to be able to tell these things apart. Well, tell me something. Again, I know in fairness you haven't looked at those other tissues yet, but while this lymph node slide in front of you has lymphatic follicles on it, is that the only thing that is on this slide? No. Identify some of the other things here that you may notice about them. What else do you see on this slide? Excellent, trabeculae. You see a fibrous capsule and you see a trabeculae. Do you think a tonsil has a trabecula like this? Nope. Do you think our small intestine has a trabecula like this? Nope. What else? What's else that's something here that's really super obvious? Another feature that I could ask you on the exam, something you could be responsible for, the medulla. This medulla with the medullary cords and the medullary sinuses. Again, I know you haven't seen a tonsil yet, but do you think it has medullary sinuses? Do you think your small intestine has medullary sinuses? No, they don't. So the lymphatic follicle will tell you we're looking at some type of lymphatic tissue, but this is one of those cases where you're gonna to have to look at the entire tissue for some cues that are gonna help you to be able to tell these things apart. This one has a cortex and a medulla with a medullary sinus. It has a fibrous capsule with trabeculae. All those other things on the list that we talked about are the ways that we're gonna be able to distinguish this. All of our lymphatic follicles are clustered together in the cortex and there's none of them here in the medulla. So there's a separation of them there. These are the types of things you're gonna look for and even the surrounding tissues are things that are gonna help you to be able to tell them apart. A tonsil is a great example of that. With tonsils, most people have, uh, so again, we'll, we'll talk, so again, other lymphatic tissues are tonsils, are other malts, including virus patches in the appendix, the spleen and the thymus. All right, so these are the other lymphatic tissues we're talking about, but let's talk about the tonsils first. As you see from the pretty picture, with the tonsils, most people have four. All right, these four tonsils include the two palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils are these tonsils right here. They are on the lateral, oops, uh, aspect of the oral cavity. I think, oh, let me see, do I have that? I uh, hope I'm clever enough to have put this in the lecture. If not, I'm gonna be disappointed. I'll have to find it. Maybe I'll find it during, I'll find it before the next class. I uh, don't have easy access to it, shucks. All right, I don't think I have that. All right, but there's a great picture of one of the charts in the classroom that does a really nice job of showing that. So I will, a great question. Uh, let me answer that in just one second. Let's get back into here. Palantine tonsils. Uh, these are the big, huge, large tonsils on the lateral aspect of the oral cavity. Uh, basically, as you look into the oral cavity, if we were to take this head and chop it right through the mouth, uh, what you would see is there are two main arches that comes down. One goes from the roof of the mouth towards the pharynx, palatopharyngeal arch, the other goes from the roof of the mouth to the tongue, and it is called the uh, palatoglossal arch. And in between those two arches is an indentation known as the foss. 
and you have this foss on both sides. And within that foss, on the lateral aspect of the oral cavity, sits your palatine tonsils. And you have the same thing on the left as you do on the right. If you have access to a small child, uh, typically someone a, a younger than four years of age, uh, then I, what I want you to do during the next break is grab them, open their mouth, and stare at the back of their throat. Because one of the interesting things about these palatine tonsils is they start out much larger than they need to be, and we kind of grow into them as we age. If you don't have access to a four-year-old, uh, then what I recommend you do is just go down to the nearest playground, uh, find some random four-year-old, grab them, and stare into their mouths. I'm sure the parents won't mind at all. All right. I just make sure you're wearing your mask. You have to take theirs off to be able to do it. But like I said, most parents won't be bothered by that at all. So feel free to do that. Um, but as uh, uh, Rodica pointed out, uh, the problem with, exactly, it's for research. The problem with that is that sometimes they're so large, they can disrupt sleep. They can cause snoring, they can cause sleep apnea and problems along those lines. Some people have chronic problems with them being inflamed constantly. They have uh, chronic uh, 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 tonsillitis. And so in those cases, they can be removed. Now, obviously, do you die if your tonsils are removed? No, but your army has a few less soldiers. So are you potentially increasing the likelihood of you being able to get sick? Yes, uh, it is possible that that could happen. However, again, you've got a lot of other defenses in place as well. And so it comes down to, you know, sleep apnea issues, the discomfort of the chronic inflammation versus a couple of fewer soldiers. In most cases, uh, they don't have a problem removing tonsils for those types of issues. Because uh, again, the decrease in your immune uh, defenses isn't going to be as significant. David gets home. Exactly. It's for science. Yes. Excellent. No, don't do any of those things. You guys all know I'm joking, right? I don't want anybody coming back. I guess I'm recording this now. I have to be more careful about my sarcasm. All right. Tonsil stones. Excellent question. Uh, so one of the things that can happen with your tonsils is you can get buildup of calcium uh, as irritants and things like that get in there. And so stones can form in those and those can be expressed. It's not a very fun experience, but it is typically they can be expressed and um, that can reduce some of the pain and discomfort that comes along with that inflammation as well. All right. So both of those are on the lateral aspects of the oral cavity. Uh, the posterior third of your tongue is covered in the lingual tonsils. Those lingual tonsils, uh, again, uh, don't play a role in our taste or, or our speech so much, but again, they are there to help to provide that protection. Typically, they don't produce mucus, although, like I said, they can get irritated there lining the surrounding mucous membrane can do something like that. Uh, but typically the most common problem, aside from inflammation, as Ashley pointed out, with stones, where you get calcification of material inside of them. I'm not aware of any condition that causes them to produce excess mucus, though. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, was it, if someone contracts, uh, like, strep throat or gets strep throat, uh, would that inflame the palatine tonsils or the lingual? Typically, it's the palatine. I mean, it, it can inflame all of the tonsils, but the ones that are typically most painful and the ones that, like I said, have the effect on airflow more primarily are the palatine and the next one, which is the pharyngeal tonsil. Pharyngeal tonsils are also sometimes commonly referred to as the adenoids. So you may have heard someone talk about having their adenoids removed. Uh, what I was talking about is that singular pharyngeal tonsil. Notice that pharyngeal tonsil is located at the superior part of the pharynx, that muscular tube that is the throat, basically in the nasopharynx, right at the back of the nasal cavity. So if you think about it, these are our guards. As you breathe in, air has to pass through the pharyngeal tonsils, right? As you eat and drink food, they have to pass by the palatine and the lingual tonsils on their passage and on their way. So these are part of our body's defenses in those locations. All right. Uh, the adenoids is another one of those that can affect breathing and respiration, especially causing sleep apnea issues. So again, sometimes people have those uh, removed as well. But again, remember I said, ah, yes, and yes, exactly. That there's the relevant one for now. Absolutely, it is that pharyngeal tonsil that they are actually uh, taking the swab from. 
uh, for that COVID test as well. So when the, the test for COVID uh, the, through the nasal cavity involves that, uh, that, uh, that, that Q-tip, that swab through the uh, nasal cavity to that pharyngeal tonsil. That's one of the reasons why people can't really do these things at home, right? It's very hard to shove a big Q-tip through your nose all the way back to the pharyngeal tonsil. I have not been tested yet, and I have to imagine, yeah, that it does feel very, very weird. Weird. Uh, it might be dangerous to do it by yourself, to do it to yourself. That I would say is definitely the case. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Uh, no, the, it, what you're, the closest to your blood-brain barrier is actually up at the superior nasal cavity. So if you think about uh, at the very top part of the nasal cavity where your olfactory foramina are located and the olfactory bulb is located and those come in through there, that is where you have the most worries of the blood-brain barrier. But that is very superior and very anterior in location. So your aim's got to be really, really bad with a Q-tip uh, to be able to hit that instead of going all the way back. Now, as I said, that's probably why you don't have home tests for these because people at home in general are idiots. And so that's why it takes a trained professional to be able to do something like this. Uh, but if someone who is trained to do this properly, there is almost no, uh, there, let, let me rephrase that, there is no risk to damaging the blood-brain barrier if done properly by a professional. That is <laughs> right. It made you do it for yourself. I would not have done that, but that's me. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, so those are the four that everybody has. There are potentially two additional uh, tonsils that, and again, a tonsil is just a cluster of lymphatic vessels, of uh, uh, lymphatic follicles uh, that can form, and one of those happens to involve this structure right here. Does anybody happen to know what this structure is right here, this opening that they've shown here on this illustration? And I want to hazard a guess what that might represent. It's the opening to a tube, a muscular tube. Auditory tube, absolutely. That auditory tube connects to your middle ear. Right, this is what helps to pressurize it when you uh, go up to Tahoe for the weekend. You go up to Tahoe for the weekend and your ears start to feel a little bit funny. So what do you do? You open your mouth, you, you talk, you chew. You do not hold your nose and blow. If you hold your nose and blow, I will take participation points away from you in this class. The worst thing you can do. When you do that, all you do is run the risk of shoving mucus up into that, congesting that tube, and dramatically increasing the likelihood of you getting an inner or a middle ear infection. Uh, <laughs> blow air bubbles out of your eyes underwater. No, what you are doing in that case is you are actually pushing air up your lacrimal duct and you're pushing it up your lacrimal duct and coming out that way, which is, uh, uh, I won't lie, a little gross. <laughs> but isn't that, it, it, in Bull Durham, isn't that how they, uh, you, you taught them to breathe out the eyelids? Uh, so for that, like the iguana. All right, that is your auditory tube. Yes, I've heard people can do that with milk as well. Don't do that with milk, it's bad for you. All right, <laughs> we are getting way off track here. All right, so. This auditory tube is an important opening for equalizing the pressure of your middle ear. What can happen is in the fold of the membrane that surrounds it, there are these small clusters, lymphatic follicles that can form that are called the small tubal uh, tonsils. Uh, many people have them and it's not necessarily an issue. Uh, the problem with it is that if you have chronic inflammation of these tubal tonsils, it can cause swelling that closes off your auditory tube and dramatically increases your likelihood of getting middle ear infections, especially when you are younger. So if there are younger kids who have had a lot of uh, middle ear infections, it's quite possible that they could be having problems with their small tubal uh, tonsils, and that can be one of the causes for that. All right. Now, like I said, our goal is going to be to be able to identify them. And notice, different stains, so different color, but a lymphatic follicle, well, let's take it a color that we can actually see. 
lymphatic follicle is still a lymphatic follicle, whether it's a lymph node, whether it's a tonsil, whether it's the spleen, whether it's whatever. So notice the follicle itself isn't how we're gonna be able to tell that this is a tonsil. But there are two things that can help us, well really three. Notice, first of all, that what happens here is we don't have two distinct regions. There's no medulla. There's no region of this that doesn't have uh, follicles in it. So it's not like there's a big open space in the center of it. The follicles are distributed throughout it. So that's one of the things that we're looking for. The other two things that we're looking for are these large invaginations. Notice there are these massive, large, deep invaginations to these tonsils. Right? If you think about where these tonsils are located, the opening of the nose and the opening of the oral cavity, this is where things in our air, things in our food, things in our drink can get lodged in these spaces or at least congested in these spaces for a period of time. And that allows it more time to come in contact with the follicles. Any idea what these large invaginations might be known as? Tonsillar crypts. Tonsillar crypts, excellent. Someone has their study guide printed out and in front of them, excellent, right? Those are our tonsillar crypts, absolutely. So tonsillar crypts are only found in one location. So if you see tonsillar crypts, guess what you're looking at? Tonsils, there you go, wasn't a trick question. Now, am I gonna make you distinguish between the four types? Histologically, looking at it right now, just by looking at this one, can we tell whether it's a pad, uh, palatine or a lingual or a pharyngeal? No, no, but like on a, on a model, or an illustration like the previous one, definitely I can, but histologically, I will not. Now, there is one other way that we will be able to tell. It's a little tricky because this is a lower magnification, but where are these tonsils located again? They're in the openings. Right, uh, openings to the outside world, more specifically the pharynx and the oral cavity. Right, that's where these are located. Now these are openings to the outside world. So that means they're lined by a mucous membrane. So this out here would be a mucous membrane. Uh, this part covering over here would be a mucous membrane. And sometimes you can actually see a little bit of the mucous membrane lining some of these larger crypts. And this oral and pharyngeal mucosa like all mucous membranes is comprised of an epithelial tissue on top of a connective tissue. And if we we're talking about the oral cavity or the pharynx, what epithelial tissue would it be? What epithelial tissue lines, there it is, excellent. Alexa's got it, a non-keratinized. Sim uh, no, 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 not simple squamous, but stratified squamous, right? We're not going to want just one layer of flat cells protecting our oral cavity from that hot coffee we had from breakfast, from that molten cheese of the hot pocket you had for lunch, from the sharp tortilla chips that you had with your dinner and your uh, margaritas, right? We need more than one cell layer for that. So it is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue that lines that. And what would the connective tissue be again? Yeah. Areolar. Now, if I remember correctly, an areolar connective tissue, oops, if I spell it right. Areolar. Connective tissue uh, that is part of a mucous membrane based on its location has a special name. What would we call that areolar connective tissue that is part of a mucous membrane based on its location? Lamina propria, excellent. I wasn't kidding in the last section where you're not done with your tissues yet. We are gonna to continue to use tissues through all of our sections, excellent. So we have this mucosa. And so again, at this lower magnification, it can be harder to see it. But in a higher magnification uh, picture, if you were to look at this tissue right here, you would see that it is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, often lining the inner surface of these larger crypts. 
you can see a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, right? We can very clearly see the real art connective tissue right here that based on its location, we know is a lamina propria. So we know all of that stuff is there and we are definitely something that we could be responsible for on the exam, but it's also the things we can use when we look at a slide like this to know we're looking at the tonsils. So like I said, follicles aren't gonna do it because everything has follicles in this. We have to look at the surrounding tissue, the surrounding structures to figure out what it is. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Those are our tonsils. Let's talk about some of the other mucosa associated lymphoid tissues. Again, they line the mucous membranes of all of our openings. So again, that means respiratory system. That means uh, reproductive. That means digestive. And that means urinary. All of those organ systems that are open to the outside world and lined with mucous membranes have uh, malts associated with them. But there are some that are a little bit more elaborate than others. One of the big ones are what are known as Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are located in the distal part of the small intestine. The small intestine, and again, I know we have not talked about the digestive system yet, but some of you may be aware of this. The small intestine is divided into three parts. Anybody know what the name of the distal part is called? Anyone know the name of the distal part of the small intestine? Anyone know the names of any of the parts of the small intestine? Duodenum. Duodenum, excellent, or duodenum, excellent, that's one. Duodenum. Ilium. Ilium and jejunum. jejunum, there you go, excellent. So of those three, the uh, duodenum, the ilium, and the jejunum, anyone know what the distal part is? Jejunum? Nope. Nope. So what is the ilium? Ilium, there you go. Excellent. It, the distal part is the ilium. Again, you don't necessarily need to know that for this part. However, when we get to the digestive system, histologically, you are going to need to be able to tell the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ilium apart. And the way you're going to tell the ilium is by the presence of these pyrus patches. In the ilium, we have these big clusters of lymphatic follicles. Why? Why might we want those in the distal part of the small intestine? What is the distal part of the small intestine connected to? The large intestine. The large intestine. And what is the large intestine chalk filled with? Bacteria. Absolutely. Guess what? Every single person in this class and every single person you know is infected with E. coli. Yep, every person you know and every person you've ever met has E. coli in their body. But where is that E. coli located? In the intestine. In the large intestine, absolutely, where it's actually beneficial. It helps you to break down some of the digestive materials that you're not able to break down on your own. So it's actually doing a decent thing there. However, do we necessarily want that E. coli to get a wild hair and decide to start roaming around the body? No. Absolutely not. So again, it's about placing our guards. We have these pyrus patches in the distal part of the small intestine where it is closest to the large intestine. So if any of that bacteria right, gets any kind of crazy ideas about roaming around through the body, we have those pyrus patches there to be able to provide that defense, to provide that protection, right, that is going to help us to be able to do that. Along those same lines is our vermiform appendix, right? I know most people think the appendix is like a tail, something that does nothing useful, nothing uh, beneficial for us, but we're finding more and more that that vermiform appendix can be pretty important. That vermiform appendix is called vermiform because vermiform means worm-like. And the appendix is basically a long, narrow tube. And this long, narrow tube is filled with lymphatic follicles. 
So we have all these lymphatic follicles filling this long, narrow tube. Well, it's a tube, so it has fluid inside of it. And the fluid inside of it, we have found more and more that inside of this is clusters, what we call seed clusters of uh, bacteria. Oh, I remember reading about this. You do or do not? I do. Excellent, yeah. Gut health, like Ashley pointed out, is one of the really, really uh, um, majorly advancing fields of studies. Again, now everything's COVID all the time now, but uh, before the COVID thing, there was a tremendous amount of research and interest looking at to your bacterial flora and fauna of your digestive system. They were finding that uh, deficiencies, there's a lack of base, a certain bacteria could be the causes of some food uh, sensitivities, uh, even some potential uh, autoimmune disorders. So one of the things that were, they were looking at is, you know what, if we're able to change the bacterial floral and fauna of an individual, we can actually change their health and change their conditions. And how do they do that? How do they change your bacterial flora and fauna of your large intestine? Probiotics. Probiotics is one of the ways they can do it, but someone else is transplant. there you go, a poop transplant, absolutely. Okay. There are people who are paid hundreds of dollars for their defecations because they just happen to have the right combination of bacteria in their large intestine that they're able to sell each one of those bowel movements for hundreds of dollars where they are able to then take those uh, process it, clean it without destroying the bacteria, form it into pellets that can then be inserted into your bum uh, so that they can change the bacterial uh, flora and fauna of your digestive system and play an important role in potentially changing your overall health and all sorts of things like that. Yep. Um, so again, it, it, it is a tremendous new um, a market, absolutely. <laughs> Where can I apply for this? You have to have the right kind of poop, though. I don't know who the people you talk to about that that is. But the point is that your bacterial population of your large intestine is important. And the problem is, uh, I have no idea how they test for that. That's a great question. The other problem, the problem is that there are things that can affect your bacterial uh, colony inside your large intestine. Obviously, taking antibacteria. Uh, anti antibiotics is something that can affect it because while they, they destroy harmful bacteria, they also uh, damage your resident bacteria. But even uh, diarrhea and things along those lines, other irritations from foods that you eat can cause a flushing of the system. And what they found is that these seed clusters in our appendix can actually play an important role in repopulating our flora and fauna when it is disrupted by some other type of behavior. Like, you know, you had, you know, a gas station sushi or like something else happened where you had, you know, your flushing of your system from being sick or something along those lines. About the, probiotics. I'm sorry? Uh, what about probiotics? Probiotics can also help to play a role in uh, repopulating the bacteria. So it is something that they do recommend that you take uh, when you're on antibiotics as well, yes. But it's like I said, the vermiform appendix has its own little uh, seed clusters that can help with that as well. The problem with the appendix is, as I mentioned, it is filled with uh, lymphatic follicles. And so as those lymphatic follicles swell, if we get a swelling of one of those follicles, those follicles can cause a constriction of the fluid fill hole in that. And as a result of that, your appendix swells as it becomes congested with that fluid. And what do we call that condition? Appendicitis. Yeah, seed colony, seed clusters, exactly. I'm sorry? They call that appendicitis, absolutely. And the appendicitis is connected to the cecum. The cecum is where your food, basically after it's been mostly processed by you, enters, and that's the stuff that eventually is gonna become feces. So it's soon to be feces. So if this appendix gets so large that it ruptures, it tears a hole in the cecum, and soon to be feces spreads throughout your abdominal pelvic cavity. And is that necessarily a positive thing to have happen? Not at all. Nope. No, not at all, exactly. So that's why that appendicitis is so uh, dangerous when it occurs. 
right? But again, is it, they're finding more and more out about the bacterial uh, composition of your digestive system. The importance of the appendix is becoming more and more relevant. So right. what happens to someone who doesn't have an appendix anymore? How do they reseed? Um, it, my guess is that for those people, it's probably more challenging. Uh, again, you're never, it, 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 even with antibiotics, you're probably never going to destroy any, uh, I mean, all of the bacteria, but it can affect the composition of it come back. So my guess is that people uh, that do have to be more careful about taking biotic and uh, taking probiotics or eating yogurt or doing things along those lines to help to maintain a healthy uh, bacterial composition of the digestive system. Again, this is really new research. I'm not sure if they've done studies yet to look at what the long-term implications of having an appendicitis, I mean, an appendix removed is as a result of that. So I'm not sure if that study, those type of studies have been done yet, but it might be something that'd be interesting. But again, if it's going to explode and possibly kill you, then affecting the ability to be able to repopulate your bacteria is probably your least of the concerns, right? It's the, definitely the lesser of two evils in that case. All right, sounds good. All righty. So once again, notice a follicle is a follicle is a follicle. In this case, notice we have kind of a peripheral sectioning through the follicle. So notice we really don't see much of a germinal center in this. Because again, think of it, this is a two-dimensional view of a three-dimensional structure. If you throw an apple in the air and randomly slice it, are you always going to go through the core of that apple when you do that? No. No. And so that's basically what happened here. We don't see the germinal center because this is kind of a peripheral sectioning through it, but we still see that dense cluster of cells uh, that tells us that this is a lymphatic follicle. And again, follicles look like follicles like look like follicles. But notice in this case, we are in a location where there are these big invaginations filled with uh, goblet cells. If we were at a little higher magnification, but you can still kind of see this is lined with a simple columnar epithelial tissue. So you have this simple columnar epithelial tissue with a lot of goblet cells in these invaginations. This clearly tells us that we are in the intestines. And if we are in the intestine, uh, then we are definitely looking at a Peyer's patch. So again, it isn't going to be the follicle itself that is going to tell us what we're looking at. It's going to be the surrounding tissues, right? We just talked about the small intestine has villi. So if you see it's a lower magnification view and you see these big, huge villi and then these big, huge Peyer's patches underneath them, then you know these are the Peyer's patches, these lymphatic vessels in the small intestine because of those big, huge villi that you can see. So again, it's gonna be the surrounding tissue that is gonna help you to tell which lymphatic tissues we are looking at histologically. All right. Questions on that? All right, let's talk about the spleen. The spleen basically takes the space of the liver on the left side of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Here's that big, huge, massive liver, and the spleen is obviously much, much smaller than that uh, next to the stomach, as we see that there. The spleen is the largest lymphoid organ in an adult. What does that mean? Not in the kids. Right, it's not the largest lymphoid organ in kids, but it is an adult. It is also very well vascularized. The good news is it's pretty well protected up in the... Uh, upper left side of the abdominal pelvic cavity is very superior, so it's kind of located underneath the ribs. But uh, if you happen to be riding a horse and fall off or fall off a diving board or something and damage the spleen, uh, often they will just remove the spleen rather than trying to sew it back together because it is so vascularized. The likelihood of it tearing again, the likelihood of there still continuing to be internal bleeding is so much of a concern that it's easier to just simply remove it instead. The spleen in many ways is like the lymph node of the blood. Blood passes through the spleen and it's the spleen's job to help to filter it. The spleen, along with the liver, plays a very important role in breaking down dead and damaged red blood cells, helping to recycle the iron 
So the spleen typically has a very, very dark red coloration to it, very much like the liver, because it is a very high concentration of iron in it uh, from the breakdown of those red blood cells and any other abnormal cells that are floating around in the blood. But the other thing that it does is it's also the same way that we have lymphocytes that monitor the lymph, we have lymphocytes that are monitoring the blood, looking for harmful things, and it can also stimulate an immune response. And this is something we see very clearly when we look at the anatomy of it, or more specifically, the histology. Notice it also has that fibrous protective outer structure that is going to be a fibrous capsule. It also can have some trabeculae that actually can penetrate down, although they're typically not as prominent as what we see in a lymph node. But notice in this case, we don't have all of the follicles uh, clustered in one area and all of the rest of it open. This one looks much more like, kind of like Swiss cheese is what it reminds me of. We have a big chunk of the spleen. You're gonna see a follicle here, and a follicle here, and a follicle here, and a follicle here, and a follicle here, all over the place. It's kind of evenly distributed throughout the whole spleen. And in fact, the two areas of the spleen have different names and different functions. This portion, as you can see, is what is known as the red pulp. Why is it called the red pulp? Because it's the part that is red in color. This is the part where we're storing the iron. This is the part where it is breaking down and recycling red blood cells. The uh, follicles don't store the iron, so they're much lighter in color, and so they are referred to as the white now I know this particular stain they're using, it is ironically darker in color, but notice you can clearly see that follicle shape. We have the dark outer area, the lighter inner area to them. But there's one more important thing, and I'm gonna change the color of this. The color will work here well. Maybe let's see if the brown works. Make it smooth. Remember, these follicles are involved with filtering the blood. To do that, blood has to pass through them. And so if you notice here, we see a longitudinal view of, a, of the blood vessel that passes through it. Here, we see a cross section of a blood vessel that passes through it. And here on the periphery, we see where a blood vessel is entering these. So notice here in these particular follicles, either in cross section or in longitudinal section, you can see a blood vessel that passes right through the center of them. And this blood vessel that passes right through the center of them is what is known as the central artery. Notice none of any of the other lymphatic follicles that we've looked at have these central arteries in them. But here in the spleen, it filters the blood, so we need blood to pass through them. And so while it is not wrong to call these lymphatic follicles, it is more appropriate to call these splenic follicles or splenic nodules. And we can tell they're splenic because they have those central arteries that pass through them. Again, it's never gonna be able to compensate completely. There is gonna be a decrease. A lot of the functions of the spleen uh, would be taken up by the liver. Like I said, the liver does also play a role in filtering uh, the dead blood cells out of, and damaged blood cells out of the blood. It also stores iron. It also helps to trigger an immune response. So most of, its func most of the functions of what the spleen do did, does uh, would be taken up, is already even done by the liver. So the spleen doesn't do it exclusively, the liver helps with that as well. But without a spleen, you're not necessarily gonna be as effective. But again, it's very well vascularized. If it's damaged and bleeding and you leave it in there, then you're gonna die, 
right? It's better to have a few fewer soldiers than to be dead. So in all these cases, right, when these things are removed, um, again, it's not something, uh, uh, tonsils are a great example, right? Uh, when my mom was a child, you know, many, many years ago, if you coughed, basically they would take you in and take out your tonsils, right? Because again, everybody got their tonsils out, they got to eat ice cream for a weekend and they moved on with life because they just figured it was a preventative thing. It was easier to do it before than after. They are much less cavalier about removing tonsils now, but still, if you're dealing with chronic issues or sleep apnea or something along those lines where it's affecting uh, someone's quality of life or, or things along those lines, then absolutely it is still something that they're comfortable doing. Yes, you weaken the overall defenses, but as we'll learn, we have a lot of defenses. So losing one segment of soldiers is still better than, than you know, death or, or you know, not getting enough oxygen while you sleep and all the problems that happen with sleep apnea and things along those lines. All right. All right, that is good for that. Let's then, oh, and so here we go. Here we see another different stain, different color. But again, here's the white pulp. Here is our red pulp. Here is that fibrous capsule on the outside. This stain doesn't show the blood vessels quite as well, uh, but you can see uh, one of the blood vessels. I'll put a circle around it right there. There's a cross section through one of those central arteries that is passing through it here. And here it is on this one here. But again, notice I wouldn't use ones like this. I would use pictures like the previous one, right? Again, my goal is to always use things that are obvious. So if you go back to this previous picture, this one here, this one here, these are clearly blood vessels at the center of those. Those are obvious. So those would be the kind of examples that I would use. But this does show a nice job of showing how it's kind of randomly distributed throughout and not just clustered together near the surface. So again, a way that we can tell that this is not a lymph node. All righty. Last but not least is the thymus. Remember we said the spleen was the largest adult lymphoid organ. The thymus is the largest and most active in adolescence. Now again, obviously you as a young adult have a larger thymus than a two-year-old does but we're talking about relative size. The relative peak size of the thymus is at age two. In fact, if you look at the thymus at age two, it almost completely drapes over the heart, obscuring the view of the heart in this type of a picture. Whereas as we age, our body gets relatively larger and the thymus gets relatively smaller. And it continues to get smaller. As we age, the thymus starts to deteriorate. And by the time it reaches age 50, it is not gone entirely. But just like we can see there is some adipose around the blood vessels of the heart on the outer surface, the, cardiac, the, the pericardial sac has adipose that will accumulate on the outer surface of that as well. And by age 50, the thymus pretty much becomes indistinguishable from the surrounding adipose. You really can't distinguish it. There are still clusters in there, still doing their job, but not nearly as many. And it basically uh, decreases to a size where it's almost indistinguishable uh, anatomically as we look at it. Right? Does that reduce the number of T cells? Yes and no. Yeah, it, it does definitely affect our ability to produce new T cells, but many T cells last for long periods of our life. But does it affect the robustness of our immune response? Do we have to be much more worried uh, about that 72-year-old grandma getting sick than we do about the 24-year-old getting sick? Right? If we've learned yeah. nothing about COVID, that's one of the things we've learned, right? Uh, the, the immune response for the younger people tend to be more robust than for the older people. So typically for not just things like COVID, but for lots of things, pneumonia and all, all sorts of other disorders, uh, typically the more uh, suppressed your immune response is, the more susceptible you're going to be. And this is one of the things that happens. So definitely it does decrease. It doesn't destroy it completely. We still do have an immune response, but that immune response is not going to be as vigorous as it is when we're younger. The thymus is comprised of two different lobes made up of individual lobules. So we have connective tissues separating it into individual lobules. Notice it's not on your histology list. I'm not gonna make you recognize this histologically, but we are gonna talk a lot about its function, both in our immune response and then also again in our endocrine system. 
because our thymus produces a hormone called thymosin. What's unique about thymosin is that unlike most circulating hormones, where it can enter in the body and go to some other location to have an effect, thymosin actually affects the lymphocytes in the thymus. So this is a hormone that actually is produced by an organ, and then this organ is the one that uses it. This organ is the organ where that thymosin is used, and it's used to mature and program our immature lymphocytes. And when they are mature, these that mature in the thymus become what? T cells. T cells, exactly. This is what becomes our T cells. All right. Questions on that? The B cells. Oh, excellent. Lymphocytes that become B cells mature in the bone marrow. So uh, lymphocytes, uh, immature lymphocytes are made in our bone marrow and then they mature in one of two different locations. If they mature in the bone marrow, they become B cells. If they mature in the thymus, they become T cells. All right, and again, that maturation process means to become immunocompetent, to be capable of having an immune response. And we'll talk about that process actually uh, when we get to the immune response next week. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. All right, so here is the game plan. We are gonna take one more break during this break, please do not leave the Zoom room. During this Zoom room, I'm gonna set up uh, and again, randomly assign people into their groups. You will either have two or three people in your groups. I will uh, make the groups up, but I will not break us off yet because I wanna talk about them first, but I wanna get everything set up uh, as, as soon as possible. So we'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll come back at whatever 15 minutes from now is. Uh, let's see, it's 2.48, so that means 3.03. So at 3.03, we will come back, and at 3.03, we will talk about the game plan, talk about what you're going to be doing to be successful in this, and then I will actually break you up into your groups, and we will, uh, you guys will uh, talk about it, discuss it, form your topics, and we will move forward from there. All right? All right, any questions on the lymphatic system before we call it a day on that? Like I said, a lot of the processes we talked about, phagocytosis, activating these cells, all this type of stuff we're going to be talking about in our immune response that we're going to be talking about over the next week. Uh, so next week is going to all be all immune all the time. Following week is going to be all endocrine all the time. And then it's my holiday week where it's you guys are working for me first with your group presentations and then with your taking the exams so I don't have to lecture for a week. So it's going to be fun for me. Of course, then I have to grade all those things, so it's not quite so much fun. But so, any questions on the lymphatic before we take our break? All right, meet me back here in 15 minutes, and in 15 minutes, we will talk about what you need to do to be successful on these group presentations. All righty, I'm still working on putting your groups together, but let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we dive in? All right, then let's talk about the presentations and what you guys are going to be doing. Can everybody see this form? So this handout uh, is available, should be available now on uh, your modules. And basically what you are going to be doing is you as a group are going to be collectively basically picking one of three types of topics. So let's go ahead and use our highlighter here to go through some of these things. Uh, you are gonna be picking either a disorder of the lymphatic system, a autoimmune disorder, or an immune deficiency. Now obviously, what is a lymphatic disorder, a system disorder? An infection. True, or more specifically, uh, some disorder that affects the lymphatic system directly. All right, so it's a, something where you have a problem with your lymphatic system. What is an autoimmune disorder? So would a lymphatic system disorder be something like lymphoma or leukemia? Yeah. A lymphoma would be an example of that, absolutely. 
and there can okay. be numerous causes for lymphomas. What about an autoimmune disorder? What's an autoimmune disorder? Okay, rheumatoid arthritis is an example, but can you give me a definition of what an uh, autoimmune disorder is? Is it when your body like fights itself? Yeah, it's when your body's defenses, which are normally supposed to protect you from something else, actually attacks something in your body, misrecognizes uh, something in your body and attacks it. And what's an immune deficiency? When your immune response is weakened. True, Re weakened primarily because you're missing something, right? There's something missing or lacking in your immune response. And so that deficiency causes problems as well, right? There are hundreds of different types of these that you can do your presentations on. So once you get assigned to a group, and again, I'm randomly assigning you into groups of two or three students, uh, you will put this together and you will come up with a topic and you will get that topic approved from me. So before you start doing any research, you will send me a chat message in the chat w uh, window to uh, check with me to see if your topic has been taken yet. And uh, again, it's first come, first serve and only one group per topic. There's plenty of topics for everybody to have a good one. So it's not a rush, not a race, uh, but by the end of today's class, your group must have decided and get an, a, a topic approved by me. And when you are presenting that, make sure you present your uh, group, oops, that's not gonna work. Uh, present your group and also uh, make sure you specify which of the three categories that it falls into. Excuse me, Professor? Yes. Will you provide a list of disorders that you need to choose from? Nope, uh, again, I don't want to limit people that way. I want you to be able to come up with your own list. Uh, some people may have personal experience, someone in their family or something that has one of these disorders. So that could be a reason. But again, a quick Google search, a quick search on your phone or your textbook talks about them. I don't wanna limit you by giving you a list that says you must pick from this list. Are there some common ones that tend to get picked every single semester? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, and that's fine too. But sometimes people find, you know, unique ones that they want to either for personal reasons or because they want something more unique. Uh, the only concern that I have with you picking something unique is just make sure that there's enough information on it that you can meet the criteria for the presentation. Okay, but other than that, there's no criteria. Anything that falls into one of these three categories, either a lymphatic system disorder, an autoimmune disorder, or an immune deficiency is uh, acceptable. All right. Just just one of them, right? No, yes. not As a group, you are doing one topic. Okay. So like I said, if you, me, and Ashley are a group, then uh, together we, the three of us, when I put you into your breakout groups, the three of us will discuss which topic we want. Once we decide on a couple topics, you probably want to decide on two or three, then you will send me your list and I will say, all right, no one's picked your top one, you can have that, or your top one's already gone, you can have your second one. And I'll try to get everybody's first or second choice. Uh, that will be the goal. And usually there's enough uh, diversity of that when uh, that's not an issue. All right. Then you can spend the rest of the class time today starting to game plan how you are going to do this. Now, uh, you are going to be, you are welcome and encouraged to use your textbook as one of your primary resources for this project. But you are required to have at least three different references. One of them can be your textbook but the other, there has to be two additional references as well, all right? When you get these references, you need to record these references. I want your references listed, and I want them listed on the outline. The primary reason I want this is because if you're doing some disorder and someone else is like, oh, hey, I just found out my aunt got that disorder, and they want to find more information about that, by you presenting us with your references, they have some place where they can go and they can find that. It can be textbooks, it can be uh, articles, it can be websites. I don't care about your format of your reference. What I care is that you give us a reference so that if someone is interested, they can find that information. That is what I want. I want something that somebody can use. So if it's a website, give me the website. If it's a journal article, give me the journal article and the, and the issue number and the page numbers and all of that so I can find it if I need it. All right, and you are gonna put that on your outline. So as part of your outline, it's gonna have your references. If you do not put your references on your outline, and it seems like every semester at least one group forgets, you will lose five points from your total score. 10% right off the top taken. So no excuse not to do that. Make sure you do that. All right. 
Questions on that? Get 50, uh, 50 points as a group or each person? And so you will get one grade for the group. So if you, me, and Ashley do this as a group and we end up with 48.5 points on our presentation, then all three of us collectively as a group get 48.5 points out of 50. But it's not like I'm gonna get 50 and Ashley's gonna get 40 and you're gonna get 45. Everybody in the group gets the same grade out of 50 on this presentation. It is a group presentation. I want you guys working together, sharing the workload because everybody in there gets the same grade. Okay? All right. What you are gonna be doing once you collect this information is you are gonna be presenting a live oral presentation of this topic to the group. I do not want recorded videos of you. I want live oral presentations and it needs to have a visual component. There must be some type of slide presentation that you are using, all right? Kind of like I'm doing right now, kind of like I'm doing during lecture. During lecture, we look at slides, I'm a viewable in the corner and, you pre and pre I present the material. That is exactly what you are going to do. I happen to use PowerPoint. If you want to use Google, if you want to use Prezi, if you want to use some other format, if you want to have a PDF like I have a PDF here and scroll through it, that is fine as well. There must be a slide presentation. But what it has to be is it has to be images, charts, images. I do not want your script of what you say word by word on the page because then people are reading what you've written and they're not listening to you presenting it. Again, you're not required to do it like I do the lectures, but the lectures is a perfect example of what I'm looking for. If you think of my lecture slides, I have two or three key words or two or three key sentences, but that is not all I say. I talk about other things as well. I expand on those. Those are our breadcrumbs that walk us through the path that we have of where we're going. And that is what I want. I don't want everything you're gonna say word by word on this page. I want them to be visual. I want them to be images or in a, some, a, some type of slide, but not your script. Absolutely, you are allowed to write a script. I encourage you to have one. Uh, you can use video clips. The one thing that I will warn you on that is you have a very tight time range. Uh, students, and, and again, I will warn you right now, this is the very first time I've ever done this online. I do this every semester in the classroom. Uh, and so again, I have some familiarity with it, but this will be the first time doing it in this format. What happens in the classroom when people use video clips is remember, this is an oral presentation. You are getting graded on what you say. If you play a three minute video, that may help people to understand the information, but you're not getting credit for the things that are said in that three minute video, which means that everything that was in that three minute video, you have to say again so that you get credit for it. And so often what happens when people use video clips is they go over time. So I will not say no. If you have a video or an animation or something that shows your point really, really well, you're welcome to use that. But remember, you're getting graded on what you say, not what is on some video clip. Okay, so just be careful how you use that video clip. And if it takes you five minutes to get that video clip up and running, that counts against your time as well. So just be aware of those things as you're doing it. I will not say no, but those are the errors that I've seen people make in the past. They either rely on what the video says, so they don't say the information themselves, so they lose points that way, or it costs them too much time. So just be aware of that if you use this. All right? Again, like what's going on right now, you will be presenting by sharing your screen. I am sharing my screen right now. I am on camera. And that is how you're gonna be as well. But you are not being graded on your presentation skills. So if you want to sit there and not look at the screen and read your script the whole time, that is totally fine. I'm not grading you on your presentation skills. So if you want to have your script written out so you read it word by word and you make sure you say everything you wanted to say, perfect. I'm totally fine with that. You don't have to look at the camera if you don't want. Right? Again, I know people don't necessarily like being on camera, but you have to have it on. And remember, think about the lectures. During the lectures, how many times are you looking at me and how many times are you looking at the screen? 
for the most part, people are going to be looking at the screen. They're not going to be paying any attention to you. So this is the most chill, the most laid back presentation you will ever have to be a part of. And so it is very low pressure that way. Uh, you're not getting graded at all on your presentation skills. So there's no reason nobody should not be able to do this. Okay. And I will not be recording the presentations. Right. I record my lectures because I'm comfortable being on here uh, and I'm totally fine with that, but I will not record the presentations because I know not everybody is comfortable with this format. So I will not be recording the presentations, which also means that you as students have to make sure you pay attention because you're not going to be able to go back to the recording of it. Your combined group presentation needs to be between 8 and 12 minutes. That's not 8 and 12 minutes per person. That's total. So if you think about it, you put that together, each person basically has to talk for three to four minutes each. That's all you have to do. Three to four minutes each of talking and you've gotten your nine to 12 minutes. Super simple, super easy, all right? If you don't reach eight minutes, you will be penalized. If you go over 12 minutes, you will be penalized. Uh, I don't, uh, there is a, I don't know what the amount is. I don't remember what the amount I have in the, in the grade book as I go through this, but yeah, it depends. It, I wouldn't say it's per minute, but I would see about how far it is. Obviously, the more you go over, the more you go under, the more points you're going to lose. It is important to both be able to make sure you present enough information so that it is informative, but at the same time, you need to be able to learn to filter the information uh, so that you hit the key points. So under eight minutes, you'll lose points. Under 12 minutes, you'll lose points. I have a question. Really quick. Go ahead. So, do you want one person to screen share and like kind of flip through the slides and then people will talk, but that same person will just like flip through as if you, you go? Want it, yes. If you want to have one person control the screen and do that, that is absolutely fine. But all three people or two people should be on camera at that time. Right. Everybody okay. else, including myself, will have their cameras off. So you guys should be the only ones that are on camera at that time. But to make it easier, if you just want to have one person control it, that is totally acceptable. Okay. Yep. Okay. However, if you each want to have your own format and then switch between the screens, that's fine too. Again, it is completely however you guys want to do that. Just make sure that if you're transitioning from one person to another, it doesn't take too long because that can kind of waste your time. All right. Questions on that? All right. You are also responsible for an outline of your presentation. Again, this is not a written report. I want an outline of the breadcrumbs that are going to help people. You want to help people with the information, but you want them to be active in the learning process. So while you can have a script, don't give us your script. Because if you give us your script, we're reading that, we're not listening to you. And you don't even necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Again, you are not required to do it the way that I do it. But if you notice with my lectures, my lecture slides are posted basically as my outline. So if you take the time to make slides and then you want to make a PDF of those like I do, I do them two on a page so that they're bigger. If you want to put them three on a page, the nice thing about three on the page is then you have a space over on the side to write on. So there's the lines to write on next to the slide uh, so that people have that opportunity to print them out if they want to, especially because we're not going to be recording this. Uh, people have to have these outlines uh, and that is an important part of this process to help them to learn. But again, make people be active in the learning process. An outline should provide key pieces of information, but they still have to do all of it. If your outline is too minimal, doesn't have any information on it, then you will lose points. If your outline is not an outline, but a script or a written report, you will lose points. I want an outline. It can be your slides. If you want to do that, that is fine. And I want them the night before the presentations. So again, they are due at 6 p.m. on Monday, the 5th, October 5th. At 6 p.m. is when those are due so that I can get them posted online. So those who want to print them out ahead of time have the opportunity to look at them and print them out ahead of time. Again, this is one of those things that I shouldn't have to say, but it always happens, so I'll make a point of emphasizing it. Make sure you have the name of your disorder on your outline and make sure you have the names of everybody in your group on your outline. 
Yes, great question. I am happy if you want to give me your outline or show me your outline ahead of time, I'm happy to give comments on it to see if it's appropriate or not. Same thing for your presentation. If you want to show me your presentation ahead of time, come to my office hours and say, what do you think of this? I'm happy to look at it before that as well and give you my opinion on it that way as well. All right. All right, excellent. Uh, Jessica, we're getting to your question in just one minute. All right, so that is, um, an important part of the process. And again, if you don't have that outline to me and it is not by 6 p.m. on Monday the 5th, you are going to get 10 points deducted from your total score. So you could have a perfect presentation, but if you don't get my outline to me the night before, you're getting 40 out of 80, which is basically a B minus on that. So again, it is very, very important that you provide this to me and provide it to me on time. Make sure you have that. Now, while you were talking about this disorder in class, the other important thing you want to do is relate it to the class. Now, depending on what the concept is, that can be a little bit tricky. Some of these things may involve things from 430. If your disorder involves the bones or involves the muscles, obviously that is something in 430, something everybody had, and so it's easy to relate to. You can say, hey, if you remember back in 430, when we talked about bones, we heard about X, Y, and Z, and this is how it normally works. Well, this is how this disease messes it up. It's a little trickier if your disorder involves, for instance, the digestive system, because we haven't gotten to the digestive system yet, but that doesn't mean when you're talking about it, you still can't say, when we get to the digestive system, you're gonna learn that the small intestine does this, this, and this. However, my disease jacks it up, so it does this instead. You still can relate this to the class, even if it's something we haven't talked about yet. So it is important to show how your disorder relates to the normal function of whatever it is that you're talking about, because that normal function is something that we either have talked about or will talk about in this class. Now, Everybody is responsible for doing their own disorder, but on the day of the presentation, and I know this is always tricky because if you're not presenting yet, everybody's nervous and worried and talking among themselves, texting each other about their own conversation and things, and it's hard to pay attention to what other people are doing, but you are responsible for everybody's presentations on both the lab and the lecture exams. Now, if Ashley, during her disorder, tells us that one of the treatments for her disorder is to take medicine X, Y, and Z at 9 o'clock in the morning and 12.30 in the afternoon and 4.35 at night, is that the kind of information that's going to be on the exams? No, of course not. But knowing the general characteristics of it, the type of disorder it is, what the basic symptoms are, what the basic treatments are, what the basic risks are, those type of general information, you are absolutely positively responsible for on both the lab and the lecture exams. We're not going to have people put this much time, this much effort into a project and not have it be worthwhile. So obviously it counts as something on its own, but you're also responsible for all of this material on the exam, which is the other reason why we have everyone turning in outlines, because we're not gonna be recording it. You have those outlines to go back to. You should be taking notes on those outlines as we're going through them uh, so that you are prepared for the exam, which is gonna happen two days after these presentations. Lastly, as always, I want my learning process to be interactive. So at the end of your eight to 12 minutes, then we will open the floor to questions. All right, the questions don't count as part of your time. All right, so the questions don't count towards your eight minutes. So if, you're, if you know your presentation is 11 and a half minutes long, don't worry about trimming it, being worried that you are going to be able to, you're not gonna be able to answer questions. Or if, you're, uh, if your presentation is five minutes and you just go, well, I'll just take three minutes of questions. No, it, your questioning time doesn't count towards the eight to 12 minutes. But I do expect people to ask questions. I expect you to ask people questions about their groups and the group is going to try to answer those questions. As it says here as a reminder, if you have students don't help each other out by asking each other questions, then I will ask the questions. And if you are a group presenting, who would you rather answer questions from? Somebody else in the class or me? 
I'll wait for an answer. Someone else in the class. Yeah, you want someone else in the class to ask you the questions and not me asking the questions because the questions I ask are being a lot more challenging. So I expect you to, so you help out your friends by asking them the questions and they will ask you questions. And again, that helps to make it a fun and interactive process for everyone. I want these presentations to be interactive. Save your questions till the end, because again, these are timed, uh, but write them down. If you have a question, write it down and ask it at the end so that you can ask that. So I encourage everyone to write down at least one question so that at least three or four or five people can ask questions at the end and I don't have to be the one that has to challenge people to ask questions. But, because if you don't ask questions, like I said, I will. And if you don't ask questions of Billy's group, then guess what? Billy's not going to ask a question during yours either. And then it just get, starts getting ugly. So just everybody be active in the asking process. And again, we'll all be active in the learning process. Questions on that? What is the answer to the questions? Is wrong or not accurate? So, yeah. One of the interesting things about studying these types of disorders, especially immune deficiencies and autoimmune disorders, is that we don't always know everything about them. We're still learning stuff about them. Many of them we don't know the causes. Many of them we don't know the cures. So sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know. If someone says something blatantly wrong, either during their presentation or during the questions, I will correct that to make sure that people have the right information. But one of the things that you'll see as we go through this is we don't have all the answers. And so it's quite possible that someone could ask a question that they don't know the answer to, not because they didn't do a good job studying, but because the answer might not be known. And so that's okay. So that is okay. Does it impact the grade? No, if you, no, yeah, again, if, if, if someone comes up with a, ch a challenging question that the group doesn't know an answer to, that certainly wouldn't cause any problems. If you get asked four questions and they're pretty basic questions and you don't know the answer to those, then I start to worry if two or three or four questions go by and you know the group, nobody in the group knows the answers, then there's a little concern that their due diligence hasn't been done. But if someone gets tripped up by a question here or there, no, that's not going to cause anybody points. All right? Like I said, you're, you're doing a, an 8 to 12 minute presentation. I don't expect everybody to be experts on this. But if someone has asked an obvious or, or, or basic question and doesn't know the answer to two or three of those, then yeah, that does show a lack of um, prep, preparation. Conversely, if you struggle with your presentation and do really good answering the questions, that can improve your grade as well. All right? All right. I want to emphasize, this is not the required order of presenting the information. If you want to present the information in this order, that is fine, but this is not the required order. However, this is how I will be assigning points for this presentation. So as long as you have all of this information, the order isn't as important as making sure that it is all there. So let's go through the criteria of how you're going to get your 50 points. The first thing you need to do is describe what the disease is and describe what the physiological basis of the disease is. All right, my disease is shapism. And in shapism, what happens is in your blood, all those circles that are on the red blood cells become triangles, right? That is my disease. It is a blood disease. It is a, you know, immunodeficiency. And I give the physiological basis of that disease. Do a good job of presenting those two topics and you will get 14 points. You need to tell us how the disease is detected and what the symptoms of the disease are. Do a good job of doing that and you will get 14 points. What are the risk factors of the disease? How is the disease treated? And again, one of the important things to remember, as I mentioned, some of these diseases don't have cures. Notice I didn't say cure. For many of the diseases that don't have cures, the best we can do is, is, is to treat the symptoms associated with it right, to help those people live a better life. So tell me about what treatments are used, what the risk factors of the disease are, that is gonna be worth 10 points. 
Again, it is very important that you relate this material to the course, either 430 or 431, six points for that. And again, make sure you have those visual aids. I don't just want words on the page. I don't care what those visual aids are. Like I said, if your grandmother has this disorder and you wanna put up a big picture of grandma on the page so that we see that, so we can all stare at her while you talk about it, great. But there are plenty of good visual aids. I don't just want slides that have words on them. Use images, use pictures, histology, uh, pictures from your textbook, all sorts of the my, almighty Google finds you everything you ever wanted to find and more. Make sure that there is a big visual component to this and that is six points as well. Put that all together and you get your 50 points. All right. Questions on any of that? Will this be available on Canvas? Yes, this is available on Canvas now. If you go in, under the modules, uh, does anybody have it up? Where in the modules is it? Is it under the lab handouts? I guess it's under the lab handouts. Yeah, there you go. It's under the lab handouts. Um, well, uh, again, if if uh, if a disease doesn't have a cure because we haven't figured out exactly what causes it yet, and there are a lot of that cases, then yeah, you need to mention that. But you can also say that this research is being done and that research is being done, or like I said, these are things we use to treat the symptoms since we can't cure it. But yeah, I mean, uh, again. One of the things about biology, and especially about this type of stuff when we're dealing with diseases and disorders, is many of them we don't know the cures for. And so the best we can do is try to treat each individual patient to the best that we can in, in the best possible way. And it's not just true for these types of disorders. That's true for cancer. That's true for all sorts of things. Yep. All right. Any other questions on the process of this? All right, so again, this handout is under the lab handouts in your module. So again, you have this playbook to tell you exactly what you need to do. I'm gonna put you all into breakout groups now. The breakout group that I put you in is your group. Uh, once I get you in the great breakout groups, I am then going to make the discussion board groups in Canvas for you as well, so that you will have those groups that you will be a part of and I'll make a discussion board for that. Uh, while I'm working on that, if you as a group decide on, and again, I would recommend come up with three, pick up three disorders, put them in order, one, two, and three, send me a chat request in this group, in the Zoom group chat, send it just to me, privately to me, and then I will, uh, I will then at that point uh, tell you which one you get, and, uh, and then I'll make an announcement to the class so people know what gets selected. All right, any questions on any of that? All right, I'm gonna break you out in your groups. I'll pull you back together one more time after this. Uh, do not leave until your group has a topic. Once you have a topic, then I would encourage you to use some time to discuss it. But once you have a topic and it is approved by me, then the time is yours and you may use it however you want. You can stay in your group, a breakout group to do that. If you wanna share information and do your own Zoom, that's easier. Although in this, in the breakout groups, you should be able to share those things. If you wanna share contact information, if you wanna social distance at Chipotle, whatever makes you happy, uh, these are your groups. You may do that however you want. I wanna encourage you not to get together uh, uh, close, social or not, uh, but uh, this can be done virtually. But again, you're all grown ups, you're adults, and you can decide how you want to treat this. All right, all righty, away we go. All right, you've been invited to your great breakout groups. Go please join your breakout group.
Nate, how's it going? Pretty good. <laughs> How about yourself? Pretty good. You <laughs> seem to be uh, stuck here by yourself. Oh, no, no, no. So my uh, my group member just went, because I don't think we can actually send direct messages to you uh, okay. f- from the breakout rooms. So he left to send the the three disease or the three disorders. That oh, we is have. that Ryan? Uh, yes. Okay, hold on. I'll bring him back into this group. So Sounds there's good. supposed to be a third person in this room with us. But That's you. No, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, they came in here briefly. Um, oh, no, no, hold on. I don't want to. Oh, no, wait, no, no. What did I just do? I don't want the breakout rooms to close. Hold on, I got to figure out how to stop this. I'll be right back. Oh, it's all good. Back here. Were we supposed to come back here?